time to get down to work. And uh, we'll start off with the land acknowledgement. Today we acknowledge that Collingwood is located on the traditional territory of the Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, including the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe peoples, and on lands connected with the Lake Simcoe and Ottawa Saga Treaty of 1818. This is the home of a diverse range of Indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors to our society. And uh, I will look for a motion to adopt the agenda. And the motion reads that the content of the council agenda, sorry, uh, for February 22, 2021, be adopted as presented, as amended. I'm sorry. First item is consent agenda item. Added uh, 8.3 various residents comments regarding report. E2021-4 application for permit to destroy trees, blue fairways, phases five and six, Cranberry Trail. Uh, an additional item motion added 10.1, development of legislation strengthening the definition of hate speech, uh, Director Culver. Uh, an amendment, deputations from Dave Merrill and Bob T Tyson uh, be permitted regarding uh, the tree cutting permit matter. And the fourth amendment is a motion regarding the Hamilton drain trail traffic uh, lights be amended. And so with those, uh, uh, can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Berman and Councillor Jeffrey, all in favor. And that is carried, thank you. And the uh, next item is declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof. Council, any declarations tonight? Seeing, uh, go ahead, Councillor Hamlin. Um, I received, uh, I'm not sure if you just included this, but I understand Councillor Jeffrey is bringing a motion uh, this evening with respect to the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay and, uh, sorry. It's a notice of motion, yes. Oh, notice of motion. It's a notice of motion. So is it will be included under the appropriate item, which is 11, notices of motion. All right, then, thank you. So I'll declare a conflict for that item because I sit as a member of the Board of Directors of that institute. Okay. Thank you. Any other declarations, Council? Seeing none, if you find yourself in that position as we move through the agenda, please let me know on the general nature thereof. And so the next item is 4.1. It is uh, the amend or the minutes from the February 16, 2021 meeting. And the motion is that the minutes of the council meeting held February 16, 2021 be approved as presented. I get a mover and a seconder, please. Councillor Berman, Councillor Comey, all in favor? That is carried, thank you. And is there any business arising from the previous minutes, Council? Seeing none, that brings us to community announcements. And we have a speaker with us tonight, uh, item 5.1, the Unity Collective Experience and an update. And it's coming from Marcia Alderson, who is a member of the Diversity Collective. Sarah, can you please? Hatch Miss Alderson through for us. Marcia, welcome. Thank you very much. Mayor Sanderson and members of council and the public. I appreciate you having us here tonight. Um, on behalf of the Unity Collective, uh, your support is very appreciated. Thank you. Now we're reaching the end of Black History Month, but this was not just another Black History Month in North America. As of a year ago, the conversation changed. Um, the collective is a, a, a group of dedicated citizens, neighbors, advocates, and supporters who are committed to taking action to promote unity in this town. We were formed after global and regional events, after the murder of George Floyd, which then sparked Black Lives Matter movements and marches across the world, and personally in Collingwood. It was an incredible time, 2,000 people marching the streets for what is right and just. And they spoke, they spoke loud, and they spoke clear that they wanted change. So thank you to the town of Collingwood um, for, for making this possible. 
and you have formed and helped uh, this group of citizens. And our purpose is to build an inclusive Collingwood that welcomes and celebrates our diversity through unified and collective collaboration and action. Mark my words, I know, our town is changing. All cultures are finding their way here because it is the good life. Because they can now work from anywhere and they choose here. Wouldn't, well, we all did. <laughs> I mean, it is pretty fabulous. So the Unity Collective seeks to see an inclusive Collingwood that is built to welcome and celebrate diversity. A strong community is the sum of all of its parts, given equal consideration and opportunity to be heard and succeed. Everybody deserves a seat at the table. So Black History Month will come to a close soon. Indigenous History Month is just around the corner. And it's our hope that on every day of every year, now and into the future, the council and members of the Collingwood community will continue their support for an evolution of understanding that will challenge the status quo and bring equity to our corner of a world that is changing. So the Unity Collective's role will be to observe and educate and partner on initiatives that follow the core values that we have identified for our group. And our values are a demonstrated foundation of trust, actions that are globally inspired, but Collingwood focused, the need to respect and promote our shared history and our stories, to be continually inspired by action and bold ideas, and to build bridges across all groups of our community. Diversity is a strength in our community. Now, on that line of telling our stories, we, as a unity collective, are pleased to promote an initiative by the Count of Collingwood, which is telling our stories. Imagine, it fit perfectly. So the Telling Our Stories initiative, our first special guest speaker is Dr. Rita Sheldon Deverell. This will be held, and if you go onto the rally point at Collingwood.ca, on February 21st, 25th at 12 noon, you'll be able to tune in and see what she has to say. Rita is a theater artist, television producer, director, scholar, a founder of Vision TV. She was the first woman to lead a journalism program in a Canadian university and concluded her term as new news director at Aboriginal People's TV Network in 2005. Now Rita's awards include two Geminis, the Black Women Civic Engagement Leadership Award, and the Order of Canada. Dr. Deverell will speak to the importance of storytelling and the role in which stories can fuel social change. The Unity Collective is all about telling stories, sharing the commonality between cultures, and making sure that every person that comes to Collingwood feels welcome, and feels a sense of belonging. This is an incredible town. I witnessed it, we all witnessed it. They all spoke and shouted for change with signs, with marching, with everything. This town is changing. I am so proud of this town. And I thank you, the council and Mayor Saunderson and the people for allowing us to create something just arm's length outside of the council that gives every citizen a voice and a seat at the table. So thank you. We're going to celebrate Collingwood as a welcome and inclusive community because my friends, they are all coming because we've got the best place on the earth and we're gonna to have to share it now. So let's open it up and let's invite all this wonderful richness of cultures and community and food and did I mention music? and let's celebrate them. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you to my fellow Unity Collective um, people. And uh, we're here. 
we're here. And if anybody has any questions, reach out to me, reach out to anybody in the collective. Thank you for calling with today. And thank you to Dean Colliver, who has been an incredible guide in this and to the town council. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Marcia, thank you for that great presentation. Council, any questions or comments from Marcia? Seeing none, I just want to thank you for all the work you're doing. I had the wonderful opportunity of attending one of your meetings and there, those are some tough discussions going on around the table and uh, we appreciate all the hard work you're doing. And so thank you to you and the other members of the collective uh, for the great work you're doing. And we look forward to the first of many stories coming up on February 25. Excellent, thank you. Thank you for your time. Marcia. And with that, then I will go around the council table, starting with the deputy mayor for community announcements. Deputy mayor. Uh, well, to be honest, I can't follow that up. So the answer is I have nothing this evening. Thank you. It's a safe answer and you're absolutely yes. right. We cannot follow that one up, but we will try. And uh, Councillor McLeod, anything tonight? I'm just busy putting uh, the 25th in my calendar. Okay. And that takes us then to Councillor Comey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just uh, continuing with that wonderful presentation in Black History Month, and we're going to tie in a little bit to Women's Day today. I thought it was uh, more than worthwhile to mention Doreen Elaine Lewis, who is the first Black female mayor in Canada. She was elected in 1984, recognized with an honorary doctorate from Mount St. Vincent University for her humanitarian work. Dr. Lewis also received the United Nations Global Citizenship Award. Winning the election in a town with only 13 black residents was an exceptional achievement at the time. Dr. Lewis, Lewis led a rich and exemplary life, excelling in politics, healthcare, academia, and the arts. And then just a quick mention that of course this week we'll also recognize Pink Shirt Day and uh, we want to thank Trevor for keeping this day at the forefront each year. As a mom to two elementary aged kids, I'm very familiar with the challenges our young people face with bullying and some of the unique obstacles they have in the online world. A favorite book in our house is a book called Wonder, which is an incredible book for middle aged uh, readers, uh, much better than the movie as always. And a quote from that book that I thought was worthy of mentioning tonight is when given a choice between being right and being kind, choose kind. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, we have next, Councillor Madigan. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Saunderson. I just wanna thank uh, our executive assistant, Jenny Haynes, for giving uh, us a reminder that it was Pink Shirt Day to our council, and uh, I found one in my closet. I see that uh, the deputy mayor has as well, so thank you very much to our wonderful staff to remind us of the little things uh, that are huge things within our community and the world, but just to remind us because sometimes we might have a selfish life and look towards uh, in respect to rather than being out and looking at the rest of the world. Thanks so much, Jenny. Appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Doherty. I have nothing this evening. Thank Councilor you. Berman. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Doherty. Councillor uh, Berman. I have nothing this evening. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Jeffrey, there you are. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Um, continuing on our wonderful celebration of uh, Black History Month and particularly tonight, I wanted to take the opportunity to comment on some of the work that our organization, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, is doing uh, over the month. And uh, they have been featuring key moments in Canadian municipal history impacting Black people and people of African descent on their Twitter account. And um, they've highlighted some of the first Black mayors and city councillors in Canadian history, along with uncomfortable truths uh, like the uh, destruction of Africaville, Nova Scotia. We do this as part of our commitment to fighting anti-Black racism, both within our organization of FCM and, of course, in communities all across Canada. And uh, my colleague and board member, Lindell Smith, uh, he's a Halifax City Councillor, he quoted, it's important to remember the terrible things that happened, the discrimination and displacement, but also the ownership and a sense of community and uh, now something to celebrate as we um, 
we move forward. So um, they're very uh, keen on hearing from our municipalities if there's something we're doing to commemorate Black History Month. And I've so enjoyed uh, members of the uh, Unity Collective's uh, articles that have been published in the media. And uh, so any of those that we can send or staff can send through Twitter with the hashtag, uh, hashtag Canadian Muni. So it's hashtag CDNMUNI and FCM will get that and uh, include it with um, their documents. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. And I saw today the article about the Collingwood Heritage Community Church, which was our local black parish going back to the 1870s. And it of course is one of the projects of uh, Carolyn and Sylvia Wilson, who also are the champions of the uh, Sheffield Park Black Cultural uh, Museum. And uh, I've been there and it is a spectacular uh, display there. So when, when restrictions permit, I encourage everybody to get out and see that wonderful museum. Uh, and as well, I'm sure they'd be happy to see you at the church as well. Uh, Councillor Hamlin. Nothing this evening, thank you. I have two announcements. The first, just picking up on the anti-bullying day. Trevor Henson has been a real champion in our community uh, for uh, and the anti-bullying campaign, and I am wearing a pink shirt. Hopefully it shows up. Uh, and we will be raising a flag, I think this uh, Wednesday, uh, February 25th. So uh, we'll invite uh, council members out to that. And uh, Trevor, thank you for all your hard work and making sure that this, this important initiative uh, does not lose its place in the calendar. And uh, secondly, uh, full disclosure, I am a member of the board of the Collingwood Junior A Blues hockey team, but they have put together an outdoor rink contest, a backyard rink contest. They had uh, over 115 entries for five categories and voting is open on the website. They've had over 2000 votes as of close end of day yesterday and the voting stays open till February 26. Uh, this has been a wonderful initiative to get people out uh, skating in the safety of their backyards and socially uh, with the, within their own bubble. So it's great to see. And uh, if you're interested in voting or seeing some of the rinks, and they are very spectacular. I was an arena manager at 11 years in my backyard, and uh, there's some great, great rinks out there. So go on just to, just to see. And it's great the Polar Vortex uh, timed it perfectly. And with that being said, we did get into our public meeting. That's item six. And I have a script to read, so bear with me. Welcome to Collingwood's public planning meeting for the proposed zoning bylaw amendment for the property municipally addressed as 2 Old Mountain Road. Members of the public will be invited to offer their comments or concerns respecting the proposal once staff have completed their review. Once the public portion of the meeting has been completed, no more public discussion will be allowed. Before closing, I will ask three times for further comments. I will then ask council members if they have any final questions for staff. It is very important that the town receive the correct names and addresses, including postal code, of individuals having an interest in the planning application. Therefore, if you plan to speak to council at this meeting, or if you want to be notified of any future council or committee meetings concerning the application being considered, you must provide this information. Under the Planning Act, one, only those who have verbally expressed any comments or concerns here tonight or provided a written submission of any comments or concerns prior to council's enactment of the bylaw have the right to appeal any decision of council to the local planning appeal tribunal. And two, if you do not make an oral submission this evening or a written submission to council before the bylaw is passed, you may not be added as a party to an appeal before the local planning appeal tribunal unless in the opinion of the tribunal, there are reasonable grounds to do so. This public hearing is being recorded. Your name, address, comments, and any other personal information are being recorded according to the Municipal Act and the Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act. The minutes will be available to the general public, including on the town's website. I will ask that planning services also confirm that notification to the public has been given as required by the Planning Act within their presentation this evening. And with that, I will pass it to Director Farr to uh, take us through the presentation. Go ahead, Adam, please. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Mr. Deputy Mayor, members of council, uh, members of the public and uh, staff. Uh, this evening, uh, community planner, Justin Tico will be providing a presentation on this public meeting. Justin. 
Hi, Justin. Hi, good Stage is yours. All right, so good evening, uh, Your Worship, Deputy Mayor and Council. My name is Justin Tico. I'm the community planner assigned to the file for Two Old Mountain Road. Next slide, slide please. So brief agenda. So the meeting will follow the town's standard public meeting format. Mayor Saunderson has already provided an introduction. And the remainder of the meeting will consist of a confirmation of public notice, an overview of the zoning bylaw amendment review process, municipal overview of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment by planning services, an overview of the development proposal by the applicant, and the meeting will be open to then receive any comments or questions from the public, followed by comments and questions from Council. Next slide, please. Tonight's public meeting is required under Section 34 of the Planning Act, and in accordance with the Planning Act, I confirm that notice of complete application and public meeting was published and circulated on January 28, 2021. Notice was given by ordinary mail to every landowner within 120 meters of the subject lands and published in the Collingwood Connection newspaper. Next slide, please. So this slide generally provides an overview of the development uh, review process. So for this application, a pre-consultation meeting was held with the applicant on November 4th, 2020. The applicant was subsequently provided with a detailed set of comments for completing their application submission. Step two involves the applicant submitting their zoning by amendment application under the Planning Act, accompanied by the required supporting plans and reports. The applicant submitted the application on January 5th, 2021. The application was reviewed by planning services and deemed complete on January 20th, 2021. Notice of complete application public meeting, as noted, was published and circulated on January 28th of this year. Step three involves the circulation of the application submission to various town departments and external agencies for review and comment. For step four, the application is currently under review and comments are being provided. And that brings us to step five, tonight's statutory public meeting. So we're here this evening to receive comments from the public on the proposed zoning bylaw amendment. And I'll return to this slide later in the presentation to review uh, the next steps. Next slide, please. So the, this, uh, the application submitted is for a zoning bylaw amendment, which was submitted on January 5th. The applicant is Crest Point Real Estate Blue Mountain Inc. And their agent is the planning consultant, Oz Kamel with MHBC Planning. The subject lands are municipally addressed as Two Old Mountain Road and represent an area of approximately 2.59 hectares. Next slide, please. This slide shows an aerial photograph of the site outlined in red from 2018. Notable change since this image was taken is the Sleep Country Store presently under construction adjacent to the First Street extension. The site's bound by Mountain Road to the north and west, Balsam Street to the east, and First Street extension to the south. The subject lands are known as the Blue Mountain Center and contain Cineplex movie theater, Staples, Crystal Buffet, and other commercial uses. Next slide, please. So this slide provides an overview of their proposal. The applicant is proposing to rezone the property from Regional Commercial Exception 4 to a separate Regional Commercial Exception Zone. The purpose of the application is to permit a pet store defined as the use of land or building where animals or birds as pets are sold kept for sale, groomed, trained, but does not include the overnight breeding or boarding of pets as an additional permitted use. Next slide, please. This slide shows the current land use designations on the property. So the County of Simcoe official plan designates the town of Collingwood as a primary settlement area, which is where a significant portion of population and employment growth is to occur. Primary settlement areas are suitable for intensification, public transit services, and full municipal services and are intended to develop as complete communities. Town of Collingwood official plan designates the subject lands as regional commercial district. Permitted uses in the regional commercial district include department stores, general merchandise stores, home centers, home improvement stores, retail commercial establishments, food supermarkets, home and auto supply stores, restaurants, places of recreation and entertainment, and business and personal services. The regional commercial district is to be distinguished by providing a planned commercial precinct that functions as a single integrated location for larger regionally oriented commercial establishments. For area A of the regional commercial district north of the First Street extension, which includes these lands, the official plan contains policies that require retail units to be a minimum of 370 square meters in size. The lands are also located within the town's mixed use intensification area. Next slide, please. Collingwood Zoning Bylaw currently zones the lands as Regional Commercial District Exception 4 or C2-4. 
The C2 zone permits a wide range of commercial uses. An exception for specifically prohibits department stores, food supermarkets, home and auto supply stores, home centers, and warehouse membership clubs. Exception four also contains provisions that require retail commercial establishments to have a minimum gross leasable area of 370 square meters, and further that the maximum gross leasable area for all lands of this zone shall be 9,290 square meters. It also requires a minimum nine meter landscape strip to be maintained adjacent to Balsam Street. A pet store is not currently a permitted use in the C4-2 zone. Next slide, please. This slide provides an overview of surrounding land uses in the area of the subject property outlined in red. Surrounding land uses are predominantly also regional commercial district zones, as well as resort commercial C3 and mixed use commercial C4 to the east. Next slide, please. This slide shows the current site plan of the subject property, which is labeled on the plan as parcel B. Circled in red is the existing building E on the property, where the proposed pet store use as defined in the application is proposed to be located. So it's the, the building that currently has a crystal buffet in the end of it. Next slide, please. So this slide is an excerpt from that site plan that shows the, the building E in more detail. Presently, building E is comprised of three commercial units and the proposed use is intended to occupy the two eastern units outlined in red. No new floor area is proposed for the requested use. Next slide, please. This slide provides some photographs to uh, give context of the area, specifically surrounding uses along Mountain Road. Uh, so we have the uh, center containing winners and um, the uh, Journeys Blend coffee shop. Next slide, please. Uh, and this provides some more uh, uses along Marks or along Mountain Road, rather, including Marks and uh, the gas station. Next slide, please. And this slide provides some photographic context for the other uses on the subject property, such as Cineplex, the sleep country that's currently under construction, and the Staples store. Next slide, please. And this slide shows building E where the proposed use is intended to be located. Next slide, please. So the proposal is still under review by town and commenting agencies. To date, comments have been received from the Nottawasaga Valley Conservation Authority and the town's Environmental Services Department. All comments have indicated no objection or have indicated no objection with standard conditions. Technical comments will be compiled and shared with the applicant so that they may, may be addressed accordingly. Next slide, please. To date, no public comments have been received on the proposed zoning by law amendment application. Next slide, please. So issues being tracked include compatibility with the planned intent of the regional commercial district and ensuring that there's adequate uh, water servicing for the proposed use. Next slide, please. So after tonight's uh, public meeting, the next steps include potential changes by the applicant to the proposal based on additional information provided uh, based on the public in input and technical comments received writing of a comprehensive staff report providing a recommendation on the application to Development and Operations Services Committee and Council, Council's decision on the application at a regular meeting of Council to approve or refuse the application. Following Council's decision, a notice of passing or refusal will be circulated to all individuals and organizations who have requested notice. This notice will also be posted in the local newspaper. Subsequent to Council's decision, there is an appeal period should anyone wish to appeal the decision of Council to the local planning appeal tribunal. If the bylaws passed by council and no appeals are received within the appeal period, then the amending zoning bylaw would come into effect. Next slide, please. So this slide outlines opportunities for members of the public to stay informed for when the application will be considered by council. Members of the public can check the town's website to review committee meeting agendas, or there's an option to subscribe to meeting updates of interest via the town's website. If a member of the public wishes to receive notice of decision on the application, please email Clerk Elmas. I want to remind everyone that tonight's meeting is to receive comment on the application from members of the public and share information on the proposal. Should anyone wish to submit additional comments or concerns following the meeting, you're welcome to email me at jteekle or j-t-e-a-k-l-e -E at collingwood.ca. So this concludes planning services presentation. So thank you, your worship and council. And I understand that the applicant also has a presentation prepared for this evening. Thank you for that, 
Justin, and I will look to uh, staff to bring in the uh, the developer, the applicant, please. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, members of council, uh, Oz Kamal uh, with uh, MHPC Planning here is in attendance this evening to answer any questions, uh, speak to the matter if he has any comments to add to that presentation. Okay. Welcome, Mr. Kamel. Would you like to add anything to uh, the presentation we've received? Uh, if, if I just have a couple slides that I just wanted to um, go over, uh, if that's okay. If, if I could just, um, I, I think I already shared, I provided my presentation earlier. So I'm okay, to that. I think they're bringing it up now. Perfect. Um, <clears throat> uh, good, good afternoon, Mayor Saunderson and members of council. My name is Oz Kamal, uh, here on behalf of Crest Point Real Estate Blue Mountain Zinc. Uh, I'm working with town staff on behalf of uh, our client with respect to this minor zoning application. There's a correction, that should be too old Mountain Road. Apologies for that. Next slide, please. Um, this, this site is zoned regional commercials, uh, regional region commercial zone exception four, so C2-4. While this zone does permit retail establishments, it does not identify a pet store as a permitted use. Uh, the pet store use will include grooming and training of pets within the building and primarily primarily sell pet accessories. Um, as Mr. Tickle pointed out, the proposed pet store definition is the use of land or building where animals or birds as pets are sold, kept for sale, groomed, trained, but does not include the breeding or overnight boarding of pets. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the, uh, the subject site is located west of Balsam Street on the north side of First Street Extension. Uh, we have, there's approximately 360 meters of uh, frontage along uh, Old Mountain Road. The lot depth is approximately 214 meters. The, pro the proposed location for the pet store is intended to occupy existing vacant space. Uh, no new floor area is proposed in this rezoning. Uh, overall, the shopping center already provides 6, 000, approximately 6,222 square meters of commercial space with 369 parking spaces. Um, we're anticipating the proposed pet store to be approximately 12,000 to 15,000 square feet or approximately 1,100 to 1,400 square meters. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of why the request is being made, it, it's, um, it's a combination of things, quite frankly. It's COVID-19 in, in addition to the changing retail environment and lease expiries have led to anticipated vacancies that will need to be filled. Um, this is becoming increasingly difficult given the Ontario wide lockdowns and the limited retail offerings available to the general public these days. Um, so what we're looking for is leasing flexibility with the use requested. So the, exi the, the existing zoning does permit a variety of uses, including retail. Um, now the proposed use will primarily sell pet accessories and have some small pets available as well. Uh, the proposed tenant works with typically will work with a, with the Humane Society and local animal shelters to assist with cat and dog adoptions by having pets in their store. Um, the, the use will include a training area for pets, as well as a grooming station where customers can bring their pets. Um, and it was just based on the variety of the offerings in this type of a retail establishment that town staff had advised that a zoning bylaw amendment be made to ensure that the retail use and all of its accessory components are properly uh, addressed. Next slide. Next slide, please. Sorry, through the chair, that's the last one. Oh, sorry, I just thought there was a <laughs> concluding slide, but I guess not. So uh, on that note, <laughs> I apologize. I'm more than happy to answer any questions that, from um, the public or, or from council. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kamel. So I will put the first call out uh, for public comment. Sir, do we have anyone in the gallery who would like to comment on the uh, public meeting today? Well, um, let me remind anybody that wants to speak to this uh, public planning meeting to press the raise your hand feature if you wish to speak and we will uh, invite you to uh, ask your questions and share your concerns. If you're on a phone, please press star nine and uh, we will allow uh, you to be unmuted and you'll require to press star six to unmute yourself. And at this point, we have Matthew Pretty that would like to talk, so we will um, allow him to join us. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
likely be participating by phone or by uh, video? Sarah, do you know? Um, at this point, we can't. Uh, we can't allow him. There's some te technical difficulty. Unfortunately, it appears that um, his Zoom does not is not compatible. So, if Matthew has any comments that he wants to share in the chat, he's welcome to do so or share it with us after the meeting. Okay. Or if he wishes to, to phone in, and if there's anyone else wishing to speak, please raise your press the raise your hand feature. And there's no further individual wishing to speak to this application. Further well, I will call for the second and third times then. Uh, so third and final call, if there's any member of the public who would like to speak to this uh, zoning bylaw amendment, uh, now is your opportunity. Sarah, we can't, you can't hear you very well. There is a question from Matthew Pretty about painting a mural uh, on the wall. So that's outside of the zoning bylaw amendment and staff can reach out to him regarding that. Okay. All right. Well, that concludes our public meeting. Thank you very much, Mr. Kamal. Thank you. And we will now move on then to item seven, which is deputations. And the first deputation, 7.1, is reopening plans. Andrew Siegert, President, Blue Mountain Village Association. If we can get uh, Andrew through. All right, it appears that Andrew should be here, so if he there he is. Welcome, Andrew. Good evening, Mayor Saunderson, Deputy Mayor Hall, and councillors. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you fine. Go ahead. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andrew Sigward. I am the president of the Blue Mountain Village Association. I just want to thank you all for this opportunity to provide a bit of an update on some of the winter operations and planning at Blue Mountain Village and to be able to make ourselves available to uh, answer any questions that you may have. A um, little bit of a background on the Village Association. So we represent about 50 businesses in the village. Uh, collectively, we employ more than 3,000 people at this time of year. Typically, we welcome about 3 million annual visitors to the resort community, uh, and that results in an economic impact in the South Georgia Bay region of about a little more than half a billion dollars. Uh, we have a strong history of successful collaboration with the town of Collingwood, despite our municipal boundaries, and we've worked together on a number of community and economic development initiatives over the years. Um, some important ones to note are collaboration on transit, support for regional health care service, tourism planning across our, our region, uh, labor supply, attainable housing research, and so much more. Um, it's been a very uh, unique and challenging period for everyone, particularly tourism destinations like ours. And uh, I think we've all done a really good job of responding to COVID-19 and really working very closely with our respective local public health agencies. Uh, that is kind of how this response plan has worked in the province. So us with Gray Bruce and of course yourselves and, and the municipality of Collingwood with Simcoe Muskoka. Uh, I do feel that we have collectively missed an opportunity to work a bit more closely to find some common ground and to respond to some of the community division that we are seeing together. And given how you know integrated and how close our communities are, I think it's really a must do going forward. Um, our members, uh, worked really diligently to prepare for this winter season uh, following a very successful and safe summer and fall season. 
Uh, that included an investment of, uh, you know, an unplanned investment in COVID protocols of about a little more than $1.2 million from our membership base in the village alone. Uh, this included a lot of one-on-one -on -one work with the uh, Grey Bruce Public Health and uh, uh, team members through that public health agency really guided us on all of our operational plans. You know, every business and operation, large and small, has had public health work with us on all of our protocols. In addition to ensuring that the, the provincial cohorts have been, or the provincial requirements have been um, applied, we've also enhanced some additional safety measures uh, that have been operating within the village uh, that I think go a bit above and beyond. We implemented mandatory mask and face coverings to be worn by anyone in the village, both indoor and outdoor. Um, we formed a really innovative ambassador and security team who has been providing on the ground uh, education and enforcement every day of the week. And really that is our, uh, you know, it's a service that we provide visitors and guests, but it's also a, a way to, to remind people, educate people and enforce COVID-19 protocols. Um, we've implemented some common uh, capacity management standards across all businesses in the village. And uh, as you know, from the documentation we sent a few weeks ago, we also suspended all of our out of region marketing. Um, uh, uh, one thing I'll, I'll share with you that we did that went above and beyond the provincial re uh, reg um, requirements, our hotel operators actually ceased operations during the shutdown, even though they were technically permitted to operate, but we chose to, to, to halt that operation uh, while we were going through the important shutdown and preparing for the winter. Um, one of the things that we've also done, we've actually done this since the beginning of the pandemic, is uh, formed a regional COVID-19 response working group. So that consists of economic development professionals, tourism stakeholders, municipalities from across the South Georgian Bay area. And we meet weekly with a goal of, uh, you know, sharing some of our demand management uh, challenges and, and data, and as well as just sharing lessons learned. So I really want to encourage the town of Collingwood to join us more frequently in that forum so that we can uh, share information and, and help each other be as successful as we can. You know, our guiding philosophy along the way has been that consistent operating controls, active safety protocols, and good support for businesses and the community is the most effective way to limit risk and our track record on that has been very strong through summer and fall and we really believe that it's not where you're from that matters it's how we all manage within our responsibilities and how we all behave uh, and that sort of filters in through all of our operational planning uh, we'd really like to work more closely with the town of Collingwood over the course of the remaining winter season uh, and beyond not only to improve our collaboration on our COVID-19 response but really to focus our energies on planning for the recovery, looking at the regional planning that I know this council is, is very focused on, and also, you know, healing the divisions within our community and helping to make sure that we support everyone. So I'd really like to suggest that we could uh, perhaps form one of those, a working group and, and see how we can achieve those goals. Um, I, I believe that Dan Skelton is also uh, in the queue and available to provide a little bit more information that uh, specific to the resort and then both he and I are available to answer any questions that you may have. Oh, I think you're slowing me. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, Council, any, no, oh, there, are any questions or comments for Mr. Siegwurtz on his presentation today? Seeing none, Andrew, thank you very much for that thorough presentation and we will be in touch. Alrighty, thank you. Great. Was um, so, I think he froze. All right. So item seven point two uh, of deputations is opposition to Blue Fairways Phase Five and Six uh, from the Blue Fairways Phase Two and Three homeowners. Sarah, who do we have uh, speaking to us from that group today? Actually, Your Worship, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Perfect. All right, Stephanie will be letting them in. And Stephanie, if you could confirm the speakers, that would be great. Uh, Beth Allen will be speaking to this matter. She's in. I just um, she can. I didn't, catch the, I didn't catch Miss Allen's first name. Sorry. Beth. 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 Okay, thank you. Ms. Allen, welcome. Can you hear us? 
Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Great. Thank you. You have 10 minutes, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor Sanderson, members of council, uh, members of the community and staff who are present today. We thank you for your time and attention. As mentioned, my name is Beth Allen and I am speaking on behalf of residents and homeowners in the Blue Fairway. I have slides and there we go. Lovely, thank you, Stephanie. If you can go to the next slide. Thank you. First, let me state that we do realize that the beauty we see here in front of us that is part of our, our lovely community is not something that we will um, see for the foreseeable future. We do realize there is development planned and it will go ahead. If you can go to the next slide, please. We are aware that this will be our future for the while in for a while at some point in, in the very near future. If you can go to slide three, thank you. However, we are asking what will be gained by the community of Collingwood by granting the builder's request to fast track this clear cutting of these 17 acres at this time. We're hoping for a better balance between the developer and the needs of the community. Next slide, please. From our perspective, we have four issues with the builder's request. The first one is the trust that we have of this builder. As, red, as residents of Blue Fairway, many of us do not have any trust for McPherson Builders. You as members of council and the mayor have received a number of letters and emails from homeowners sharing examples of our experiences with the builder. I cannot stress enough the sheer volume of deficiencies, the length of time to remedy deficiencies, often resulting in less than desirable results, the time and effort of homeowners to get these deficiencies taken care of, as well as the financial and emotional toll taken on residents as a result of the lack of oversight by McPherson on their building processes. It, appear, it appears that their business model is one of, fix, of get it up fast and fix it later, but as we have found, it is not usually fixed. And once trees are gone, they cannot be fixed because they cannot be brought back. We are particularly puzzled um, by the request to fast track, given that none of our homes have ever been uh, closed on time. Often dates are moved three to five times before the closing date. As well, uh, trades and supplies seem to be a problem right now and our phases aren't even finished. As well, they have just uh, began building the two condo buildings as part of phase four. So we're just wondering how that will be um, completed given the, the trades and um, issues with supplies. We're concerned that McPherson's ability to complete outstanding work in our phases two, three, and four would not be improved by the start of phase five and six. We're also flummoxed that McPherson can offer to pay the town a deposit for trees when the builder has yet to return our grading security deposits. This is now going on for three years for those in phase one. Next slide, please. Further, when it comes to trust, you may or may not be aware that McPherson has already clear cut an area of these, this uh, forest. Quite a large swath has been cut down already along uh, the Cranberry East-West Trail. This is an uncompleted portion of that road, but that whole area has already been cleared. Next slide, please. Secondly, the impact on the environment. We're worried about the amount of water in the marshy areas surrounding the golf course, as well as along the Georgian Trail, not to mention along our own properties here in Blue Fairway. Particularly in the spring, what happens when the significant snowfall that we've had this year no longer has trees and vegetation to absorb or help divert the water? What is the plan to uh, reduce the impact of water now and in the future? We are worried about the wildlife. There is an extensive amount in that area. As well, our mistrust of, of McPherson uh, does not give us any confidence that they will do anything to safeguard the environment. We are already concerned that piles of asphalt that have been dumped along Cranberry Trail will be buried as fill without being properly treated as required. Next slide, please. We really cannot see the alignment with the Town of, of Collingwood's Urban Forestry Management Plan, and we are puzzled as to how, according to the bylaw, 
the site plan must be approved prior to granting a permit to remove trees, and yet that site plan has not yet been approved. So we're asking what precedent is this setting for future development? Next slide, please. There's also an impact on our community. Currently, we're already experiencing a lot of traffic and a lot of noise due to the condos that are being built. This isn't a surprise, it is, it is a, a building site. However, um, it already is uh, being experienced that the builders are starting before the time that has been allotted uh, according to bylaws and after that time. Um, as well as the traffic and so on. Uh, we really would like to know what are the plans to help mitigate the traffic and the noise and who is going to provide some oversight to ensure that the builder follows any such plans. Our request, given respectfully, is that really the fast track removal of trees is denied. We've given four very solid reasons for this. You have had lots of information from residents in uh, Blue Fairways to give you a sense of what we have experienced with this builder. We would prefer tree removal after the approval of a site plan. We would prefer that the deficiencies in phases two, three, and four were addressed before the removal of the trees. We request a maintenance of a forested 30-foot buffer of mature trees that the path to the Georgian, pay, to Georgian Trail that is currently at the Atoka Trail um, is either something is put in place uh, in term so that we can have access to the trail, that there is a fulsome assessment of the impact of the water table and runoff prior to tree removal, that perhaps there is consideration for two phases rather than clear cut and build in one fell swoop, that there is some sort of assessment and plan for traffic congestion, and that the oversight of the developer during tree removal and building phases to ensure adherence to any sort of requirements, bylaws, et cetera, and uh, to ensure that there isn't any issues with grading and drainage, which I will say has been quite an issue here in Blue Fairway, and that the penalties uh, are in place for any bylaw or environmental infractions. Next slide, please. We all, love Collingwood, that's why we're here. It's a beautiful place, it's magical, and we would like to ensure that that magic continues and ensure that there is an equitable balance between the needs of the developer and the needs of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, for your presentation. Council, are there questions or comments for Ms. Allen? Seeing none, thank you very much for your time today, Ms. Allen, and for your comments. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Sarah, I think we have uh, Dave Merrill for a deputation as well. Yes, we do. We'll allow her in. All right, she should be present if she just wants to uh, unmute herself and open her video. Good afternoon, Day, how are you? Good afternoon, I'm very well. It's right. really nice, it's really nice to, to see everyone again and, and be in, in front of you. So thank you, first of all, for the opportunity uh, to speak today. Uh, Your Worship, Deputy Mayor Hall, members of council, staff, residents, and friends of Collingwood. In my two plus year term as your first poet laureate, I had many opportunities to create and deliver poems on behalf of the town, various aspects of things that make Collingwood majestic and magical. <clears throat> this offering is another in that same vein and it is specifically dedicated to the residents of Collingwood. Human, animal, plant, mineral. In particular, the seven grandfathers that we honor every day in the Awan Gathering Place. The poem is entitled, Not Today. There may be times 
when clear cutting acres seems needed, when long term accountability is ceded to attainable profits speaking louder than sustainable practices. Times when surfing the wave of a bubble is so gripping that a blind eye is turned to what is slipping away. But not today. There may be places where trees are impediments to progress, clinging to sediment, impeding the process, merely objects of sentiment, no heed paid to residents, human or otherwise. Places where those of feeling give up on speaking up on behalf of all that makes our town appealing, but not today. There may be councils that decide the will of developers trumps the will of the people it is bound to serve, that allow speed and greed to have their way. Councils that think and act that way and vote for expediency versus any real need for immediacy. But please, not today. Every tree torn out of the ground before it is absolutely necessary is an affront to our nature. Please vote now. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Jay. Council, any questions or comments for Ms. Merrill? Seeing none, thank you again for your time today. Thank you. And that brings us, I think, to our last deputation, uh, Clerk Almas, and I think it's uh, Mr. Keeson. Correct. All right, we don't see an individual named um, uh, Mr. Bob uh, Thiessen. So if he is able to press the raise your hand feature and then we can identify you from all the other attendees. All right, Mr. Thiessen should be present if he wants to unmute himself and turn on his video. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you. Uh, we can okay. see you, Mr. Thiessen. All right, let me, let me see if I can. Uh, oh, here, here we go, I think. Uh, oh. yeah, we can see you now. All right, awesome. All right, go All ahead, right. Mr. Thiessen. Welcome. Okay, it, sorry, it's Tyson. Tyson, Master Tyson. Yeah. Sorry. Just like Mike Tyson, but it's uh, the Dutch version. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I apologize because uh, number one, I don't have a pink shirt. Uh, I don't have a poem or, or a PowerPoint presentation. But again, thank you very much for allowing me to speak with everybody tonight. Uh, Deb Doherty, thank you to you for joining you know, myself and several neighbors here uh, for a walk of the uh, Cranberry Golf Course uh, yesterday, two and a half hours that we spent uh, walking with, uh, it was a beautiful day, but anyways, uh, I, I represent, you know, informally, uh, the 2,700 people that have signed our petition. Hopefully you guys uh, all have that. Can you acknowledge that you, you've you received that? No? We received the email this afternoon. Yes, yeah, I, I, sent you, I sent you an email of the names. So we have 2,700, um, you know, I'm gonna say Collingwood residents, but there may be a few that are visitors in, in, that, uh, in that list that are very much opposed to clear cutting sorry, 18 acres of forest starting in March when significant issues haven't been addressed yet. So we're, we're hoping that, uh, that the town uh, will listen. 
and we'll delay that vote. That's really what it's all about. Uh, delay that vote until those issues, those two very significant issues from our side are addressed. And I gotta say that I, I never, I, I haven't met uh, Beth Allen, but you know, I, I could use her PowerPoint presentation right now because it covered everything. Uh, the first thing is, you know, we did, we look at the Cranberry Golf Course, we all love it. You know, it's, it's, uh, it was a beautiful course and it's starting to get ugly. So if you walk along some of those uh, McPherson earlier phases, it's an ugly course because you see townhomes right on the edge of the fairway. And that's wrong. That's wrong for golfers. It's wrong for nature lovers. It's wrong for nature. And it's wrong for Collingwood. And, and we got to fix it. In, if, I, if I turn back time, the older developments all had a buffer all had a tree buffer, a mature tree buffer. So uh, Beth Allen had the, uh, you know, the 30 foot wide uh, buffer of trees in her presentation. You know, I couldn't agree, you know, more. That's, that's so important um, for the town of Collingwood, for, for everyone. So, you know, that, that should be fixed on the previous uh, phases. And it should certainly be addressed before a single tree is taken down in the 18 acres between fairways seven, five, and four. Now, it's not, you know, I got to say, it's technically, it's not McPherson's fault because the owner of the golf course severed all of those trees between his fairways, which is wrong. The town of Collingwood shouldn't have allowed that. I don't know when that was. It was probably, you know, 15 years ago for all I know, but uh, it shouldn't have been allowed because it destroys the, the beauty of the golf course. That, that Cranberry golf course, you know, is, is wonderful. They allow us to use the, the cart paths and the, and the trails and to walk it when the golf course is, is closed. So in the, in the winter months and there's, a ton of people, many of them have signed that petition that walked that golf course and and uh, Councillor Doherty walked it yesterday for two and a half hours. So we don't want to lose that. Collingwood doesn't want to lose that. So that's that's one thing. It's not about a view. It's about, you know, you guys taking the time, walk on the earlier McPherson phases, particularly you know, I, I picked two fairways, fairway 12 and 14, and you see nothing. There is nothing. There's zero buffer there between a whole bunch of decks and barbecues in the summer. There'll be barbecues out there and the golf course, the, the fairway. There's nothing. There's not, a, there's not a single tree between them. That's wrong. That's wrong for Collingwood. That's wrong for uh, the animals. That's wrong for the birds. That's wrong for everybody. The older developments kept that buffer in place, and maybe it was the golf course who did that because it was their land. But if you look at, uh, you know, the links, uh, you know, I, I'm going to concentrate on the on the uh, Cranberry West uh, developments, the five links condo boards, uh, the Briarwood ones. There's a buffer between the the development and the golf course. It was sure it was golf course property for the most part, but there is a buffer there. It's, it's solid, mature trees, which is, which is beautiful. That's the way to do it. That's the way to maintain the beauty and have a balance between development and nature. So we know that that, that, that land was severed and it was bought by McPherson with the understanding that they could develop on it, but they shouldn't clear cut, you know, all 18 acres and build every square foot within that 18 acre envelope. They should leave a buffer to the golf course. Okay, the, the second, so until that, until that issue is resolved, and I know they say stuff like, well, we'll work with uh, the town planners and we'll replant uh, some trees, but sorry, you know, we look at the earlier phases and we look at fairway 12 and 14, and I'm sure there's, there's other ones that are as bad or worse, 
and there's nothing there, and we don't want to see the same thing done on fairways four, five, and seven. So that's that's one issue, major issue. Uh, let's go on to the Atoka Trail. I think people finally understand that the Atoka Trail, which is our link from Granbury West from that bus turnaround to the uh, the Georgia Trail, it's on McPherson land. If McPherson wanted to, they could they could park their construction equipment right on that trail and eliminate it. Yeah, we understand that. It's their land. The trail runs right through their subdivision. It needs it needs to be re relocated for them to develop. Yeah, we understand that. So they proposed a a trail to the east uh, coming off of uh, I'm going to call it Cranberry East, Cranberry Trail East, the road, which which isn't finished yet, but. Uh, they proposed moving the trail to the east, the Atoka Trail to the east. So, but there's a ton of people, and and I'm going to say 2,700 of them signed a petition that use that trail every day. So we can't lose that trail. We can't lose that connection to the Georgian Trail for a day. So have the alternative trail you know, in place first, and it should be treed. We don't want a naked, a naked uh, sidewalk or gravel walkway with no trees. Have it treed that the bikes can use, that the skiers can use, that the snowshoers can use, that the dog walkers can use, all of that. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna add one more uh, because it was a, it was a very good suggestion from one of the neighbors here. Because that trail has moved so far to the east. Make sure that it's got adequate parking because a lot of people like driving and parking somewhere to take the Georgia Trail. So make sure that it's got legal parking uh, to, to access the trail. And then give the people of Silver Glen, which is a, a large new development, and Briarwood, because they're, they're losing the Atoka, give them access to the Georgian Trail on the east side of hole number six. It's very, very short, and uh, a lot of people use it already, but uh, during the, the golfing season, the golf course can't allow people to walk on the golf course, so it needs to be tweaked a little bit. So that should be done as, as well before a single tree is cut in that 18 acres, both well, all three of those things should be done. The the two trails, the one east that uh, McPherson is showing on their site plan, although it needs to be treed. Uh, the one west of hole number six for the for the residents. I'm going to say for the residents of of uh, Briarwood and and uh, Silver Glen. Although anybody could use it as long as they don't bring a car. So if they if they walk to it, that's fine. They obviously they got used to it, and Revise that site plan so that it's got a, a 30 foot uh, width of, of buffer uh, to the golf course so that we don't lose the beauty of the golf course. And and personally, I would add another one, which is go back to the earlier phases of uh, that McPherson has built and plant some fricking trees. And you don't have to plant little uh, three foot saplings, plant 10, 12 footers, you know, do do the right thing. And if McPherson wouldn't do it, or, it, or won't do it, then the town should do it. Because that's what Collingwood needs. Keep that golf course beautiful. Don't make it naked, like 12 and 14. So long story short, please delay this vote. There's no reason why the town has to rush into this. Don't start tearing this uh, these 18 acres out in March. Leave it for the fall. Leave it till after nesting season and use the time between now and the fall to take care of all of the broken things that we see already, like the lack of, of trails to replace the Atoka and like the lack of trees on fairways 12 and 14. Thank you, and Mr. Jason. That's, yeah, that's, that's your that's, 10 minutes, so yep. that's a good place to leave off. And I think you gave us uh, 
a good good airing of your views there. Uh, Council, are there any questions for Mr. Tyson? Seeing none, thank you very much for your time tonight, Bob, and for your comments. Okay, thank you. All right, Council, that brings us to our consent agenda. And the motion is be it resolved that Council hear and receive the general consent agenda and further that the information and opinions provided in the general consent agenda items are that of the authors and not verified or approved as being correct. There are three items on the agenda tonight. 8.1, Proclamation International Women's Day, March 8, 2021. 8.2, County of Simcoe, Notice of Adoption, Official Plan Amendment 6, Age-Friendly Community. And 8.3, Various Residents' Comments Regarding Report P-2021-4, Application for Permit to Destroy Trees, Blue Fairways, Phases 5 and 6, Cranberry Trail. We'll first look for a mover and seconder to receive the agenda. Councillor Berman and Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, so all in favor? That is passed. Are there any items uh, to be pulled tonight, Council? Councillor Coley. Thank you, Mayor Sunderson. It was just waiting a quick sec to see if anyone was going to pull it in that set. Why don't we take a, a moment to just further on the International Women's Day, which is contained in this consent agenda. And just to remind everybody, as Councillor Jeffrey has before, that we do have a virtual event coming up on the 8th, and that tickets are free, and this is put on by our town and the wonderful committee, and that you can get those tickets through, best I know it, through Experience Collingwood, as well as the town website. And uh, there's also opportunities to support our local women's shelter, my friend's house. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cloud. Sorry about that. Uh, just to build on Councillor Comey's uh, point, uh, I would point out, however, that the uh, the boodle bag that is coming for some people with that ticket uh, are sold out. I think I got the last one. I got a notice today. All right. Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Mayor Saunders. And I did receive a note this afternoon they'd added another 20. So if the second 20 will go quickly and it may well have, but I, I think there was another 20 re released this afternoon. Good, thank you for that. All right, Council, that brings us then to item nine, 9.1 Standing Committee Report. And the motion is be it resolved that Council receive the Development and Operations Services Standing Committee report from its meeting held February 8, 2021, and hereby approve the recommendations contained within the report as presented. First item P2021 222 here on Ontario Street, conditional site plan approval, sporting life, file number D111720. The recommendation is that the site plan be approved for the proposed Sporting Life Retail Commercial Establishment subject to the various conditions. And the second item is PW 2021-2 2020 Annual Water Compliance Report. The recommendation is to direct staff to post the 2020 Annual Water Compliance Report on the town's website by February 28, 2021. These items both passed unanimously at the standing committee meeting. So unless you want to pull them for a change in direction, I'm first going to call the vote to approve them. I need a mover and a seconder. We can move by Councillor McLeod, seconded by Councillor Doherty. All in favor? And that is approved unanimously. Thank you. Are there any of those two items that council wishes to pull or speak to just by way of comment? Seeing none, I do want to uh, congratulate our water uh, staff department uh, for the exceptional work, 100% compliance for the third year running, uh, and that is uh, a fantastic achievement. So please keep up the great work. And that brings us to item 9.2, staff reports, and these are the reports that were not unanimously approved by the standing committee, and 9.2.1. Is P2021 4 application for permit to destroy trees, blue fairway phases five and six, cranberry trail? Uh, what I think I'll do before I read it in is first turn it over to staff for the presentation and then I will read in the resolution. 
Director Farr, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Deputy Mayor, members of council, members of the public, uh, this is a presentation on the tree cutting permit request uh, by McPherson Builders for the lands known as Blue Fairway Phase 5 and 6. So in this presentation, I'm going to provide a brief overview of uh, some of the matters that were raised at uh, Development and Operations Committee, and I'm going to provide an update on uh, things that have happened since that meeting. Next slide, please. So the subject lands are located uh, about midway along the stretch of uh, Cranberry Trail um, at the terminus uh, of Cranberry Trail East and the terminus of Cranberry Trail West, which uh, are uh, portions of the roadway that are intended to be joined ultimately. Um, and it's across a, a portion of these lands that uh, are owned by McPherson Builders. Um, all these lands uh, include the existing uh, Cranberry uh, Atoka Trail, as you can see, delineated in orange on the drawing. Next slide, please. Thanks. So uh, the extent of tree removal, it mirrors the, the forested uh, cover that you see in the previous image. This is kind of a sketch that delineates uh, uh, the, the extent of the area. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the intent is to facilitate uh, tree removals for uh, 249 uh, unit development. It's a subject of uh, site plan application, file D111619. Next slide, please. So uh, the way that this uh, item came to uh, the town was uh, by way of a request from the developer. The uh, tree cutting bylaw that the town has in uh, place now uh, indicates that, uh, that uh, approvals for tree permits shall not be issued by uh, the town. Um, where among other things, there's an application for site plan approval related to lands on which the tree is located that has been submitted to municipality has not received final approval. Otherwise, uh, staff have the authority to uh, issue permits. So in this case, staff did not have that authority. The bylaw includes an appeal mechanism to council. In this case, uh, due to uh, timing, staff uh, brought the request directly to council on the applicant provided an application submission for council's direct consideration. Um, as relates to this uh, application, TAM staff uh, consulted with uh, the TAM solicitor, who's uh, ad advised that the TAM should consider recommendation uh, changes in its proposed recommendations that uh, address the mechanics of the bylaw and the fact that the recommendations in front of council uh, tonight uh, call for a delegation of the approval to the director of uh, planning and development services based on uh, conditions that are set out in the recommendations. Otherwise, as if staff had been able to, staff would have included the, the full scope of the permit of approval in uh, the recommendation tonight by way of the development agreement. And as it happens, we have been able to finalize that development agreement for your consideration. So these uh, amendments to the recommendation that had to be made. Next slide, please. So the status of uh, this file is uh, we're awaiting a third submission on a site plan application. Uh, ecological study was completed and uh, peer reviewed as part of the uh, permit application remove the trees. The lands are uh, designated medium density and uh, they're zoned residential and our R3 uh, zoning designation, I'll speak further that to that later. Uh, they form part of a draft plan approved subdivision that includes a master subdivision agreement. Uh, the owners provided a timeline, and I'll review that in a moment, that indicates that if true, tree removals are delayed past uh, April 15, which is the beginning of the bird breeding season restrictions, that they would have to wait till uh, the end of that restrictive period to begin site preparation activities, which would result in a delay to the delivery of uh, units. Um, and uh, 
The owner has indicated that they're prepared to enter a pre-development agreement that would include performance requirements and uh, securities to address various matters. Next slide, please. So this is the timeline that I mentioned. I, I think I misspoke there. It's not a two-year delay. It's a one-year delay. Um, but uh, if the trees are cleared before April 2021, then the targeted uh, closing date for the delivery of housing would be uh, August 2022. Whereas if the trees are cleared after uh, uh, April 2021, which would be at the end of the bird breeding season, the, the delivery of units will be delayed until May 2023. Next slide, please. So this is a, an overlay of uh, the proposed uh, development on the air photo. And in this uh, slide, you can see the proposed uh, new trail location, which is uh, located at the east end of the development. You can see it denoted um, on the right-hand side of the site plan, and uh, it runs uh, from uh, the current location of the connecting link at the Georgian Trail, instead of traversing the site, it runs more directly to uh, Cranberry Trail East along the periphery of the development. Next slide, please. So this slide is uh, was supposed to be animated, so this would have been more dynamic had it an animated. In any case, this just shows you another indication of the layout of uh, of the subdivision relative to uh, the adjacent site. Next slide, please. So an update since we went to uh, Development and Operations Committee is that uh, residents have come forward with a number of issues, uh, some of which you've heard this evening, including requests for uh, buffering to be imposed, a 30-foot buffer um, uh, around the periphery of this development that uh, there's been significant concern about trail access, um, including the timing of the trail, and in, in some instances, the, the location. Um, there are also some questions around process and timing and some additional other issues relate to uh, developer performance with respect to uh, uh, closings and deficiencies in the development and the buildings themselves. In this, uh, in this case, uh, I, I cannot speak to those issues in the context of this uh, uh, proposal uh, for tree removals. Um, I do, do want to speak briefly to process and timing, as I indicated, the manner in which the application came to uh, staff was uh, through the tree bylaw provisions that do provide a mechanism for appeal where there is a staff refusal. Um, staff are prohibited from um, issuing a permit in this case, and as such interpreted the provisions of the bylaw to allow that appeal mechanism. As I indicated earlier, uh, in consultation with the town solicitor, out of an abundance of caution, there have been some modifications made to the proposed recommendations to reflect, uh, reflect that, and also the mechanics of the bylaw, um, which uh, at this time would require, rather than council approving the permit directly, um, delegating that authority to the director position in order to finalize the agreement. So those have uh, resulted in changes to the recommendations. We've also received a draft uh, development agreement from um, the builder um, addressing some of the performance requirements and detailing information we didn't have previously, which was uh, the provision of the $250,000 security. I'll speak to uh, the details with regard to that in a second. So we amended uh, the report to uh, also inter uh, include some additional uh, content that we thought was important for council to have in, um, in evaluating this application. And that was uh, the, the peer review of uh, the submission provided by the applicant regarding the tree removals. And that included a study assessing the quality of uh, the woodland in this area and its ecological significance. Um, that, uh, that resulted in revised conditions, and uh, those are what you see in the recommendation that is on the agenda this evening. But as I indicated, we made some additional revised conditions to provide additional details on some additional things that the builder has agreed uh, to uh, in include as part of their proposal in recognition of resident concerns and also 
uh, some changes as a result of the advice from the TAN solicitor. Next slide, please. So I wanted to speak briefly to uh, the land use permissions on these lands uh, because um, among the issues raised by the residents have been questions about that. The, the official plan designates uh, these lands as residential and you can see that in the schedule uh, excerpt at the top of the slide. And below you can see uh, the shaded color green, which is uh, uh, the medium density uh, designation. The official plan uh, uh, medium density designation sets out the range of, uh, of permitted units per hectare that are allowed in this designation and the range is uh, from 20 to 55 units. And this the proposed development falls uh, within that range. Next slide, please. The property is also uh, zoned uh, R3, which is the town's uh, medium density zone. Um, the, the proposed uh, layout in this development falls something known as it's a kind of classification, subclassification of use uh, called uh, group or cluster dwellings. So in this zone, you'll see uh, townhouses, apartments, and there's this group or cluster zone. And the group or cluster zone has a specific uh, setbacks. Effectively, what it does is it is it, it creates an envelope within which develop, development can occur. Um, uh, this is uh, in some ways a unique zone. Um, in uh, other municipalities, they, they might have a, a more prescriptive uh, townhouse uh, zone that sets out minimum unit widths and uh, various different provisions. In any case, uh, uh, the group or cluster zone provisions are, are fairly generic in nature. Um, I should mention that uh, when uh, the property is, is zoned this manner, uh, there would typically be consideration for uh, uh, possible uh, environmental studies, but this uh, zoning uh, uh, has been in effect for quite a while, and that would have been undertaken at the time that the zoning was contemplated. Um, these lands were also cut out of uh, the golf course. Um, there has been some discussion about uh, how the golf course can effectively coexist with these lands. And uh, one of the primary uh, sort of tools for uh, determining that is something called golf spray analysis. Golf spray analysis is, a, is an assessment of the statistical likelihood of a golf ball being uh, shot in, uh, in a, within a range from a tee. And uh, so this area has been heavily studied from a golf spray analysis standpoint and the review of the site plan um, is also subject to uh, ensuring that, uh, that uh, uh, golf spray analysis requirements have been met. And often with golf spray analysis, there's mitigation buffers to ensure that trees don't, or, or that uh, golf balls don't um, stray off course. So any of the, those plantings or, or vegetation that would need to be in place to ensure that the two uses could coexist uh, is required to be uh, addressed through that. Next slide, please. So just back to the draft uh, development agreement. <clears throat> the draft development agreement um, includes a security of $250,000. And that uh, security is in place uh, to address a concern that's been articulated by uh, council in the past. That concern is that an approval would be uh, issued and then the development would not be implemented and the site would be bereft of trees for a prolonged period. So this uh, commitment that's been made uh, in the draft development agreement by the builder is that uh, the infrastructure works would be complete on the site by February 22, 2022. Um, and uh, that uh, the uh, if they weren't completed at that time, that the town would be able, subject to the provisions in the agreement, uh, to uh, draw down on those uh, securities to replant either on this site or on another site and or um, construct uh, a trail uh, if there was trail disruption. So that was what our draft development agreement looked like. Uh, we've since been able to uh, make additions to this agreement, but this uh, draft contemplated completion of a permanent trail by February 22, 2022, and include the associated provisions. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, uh, there's been quite a bit of uh, resident comment, and uh, as a result of the resident comments and concerns, um, 
We did uh, include the additional information on the uh, peer review requirements uh, surrounding the tree removals in the report. But we also uh, embedded uh, some commitments that have been made by the developer. And those commitments were to uh, enhanced landscaping on the western side of uh, this uh, development. Um, there is a fairway in between uh, the Briarwood condominium and uh, this site which is anywhere uh, from about 100 meters wide to narrowing down to about 25 meters. And you'll see that again on the map when it comes up in a minute. Um, and the, additionally, uh, there had been this concern about uh, the availability of the trail and the trail connection. So the developer has uh, committed to uh, a temporary uh, trail to be constructed as soon as uh, uh, site servicing uh, works began. And, um, those have been added into the recommendations. Um, additionally, the developer would be uh, committing to carry those requirements in this pre-development agreement to the site plan agreement. There's a, a commentary in the report that speaks to uh, the need to ensure that uh, the adjacent property owner, the owner of the golf course, is satisfied with any uh, a boundary tree removals or any grading that might occur on their property. If there was any conflict uh, in the removal of that vegetation with, for example, the golf spray analysis, or uh, if there was a concern from that property owner about that vegetation removal, then that would require a re revision to uh, the tree um, removal uh, application. So the recommendation includes um, a, a recommendation that if those revisions were, were, were required, that the applicant would resubmit the uh, proposed extent of the tree removals and then council would uh, uh, delegate to the director of planning the, uh, the approval uh, for that uh, tree um, removal permit subject to all the conditions and uh, content in this report. Next slide, please. So this is, a, this is just sort of for the record here for the clerk and, and for uh, Council, this is the revised set of recommendations uh, associated uh, with this, and uh, 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 the clerk will have this available for reference later. Next slide, please. So I wanted to uh, draw uh, Council's attention to this schedule from the official plan. This schedule identifies uh, the rough location of, uh, of the trail connection that's contemplated um, across these lands and it's uh, relatively close in proximity to the proposed location that's set out in the site plan application. Uh, next slide, please. So the next steps would be um, if, if council was to approve the recommendations uh, in the report as amended, uh, then uh, we would confirm the implementation details. So that would be to finalize the development agreement in accordance with the content of the recommendations, receive the associated uh, securities and, uh, and the commitments would be uh, captured in the agreement and then the permit would be uh, issued. Um, except under the circumstances where I indicated earlier where if there's a conflict with uh, offsite vegetation removal or boundary tree uh, removals. And I believe that concludes my presentation and I'm pleased to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Director Farr. I think what I'll do is read in the uh, recommendation uh, and then uh, we can um, ask questions. So uh, it be it resolved that staff report P2021-4, application for permit to destroy trees, blue fairways, uh, fairway phase five and six, Cranberry Trail be received and that council suspend the provisions of tree preservation and protection bylaw number 2012-84 in relation to the McPherson Builders Cranberry Trail tree permit application for Blue Fairway phase five and six. And that council authorize the issuance of a permit to destroy trees, McPherson Builders Cranberry Limited for the vacant lands currently the subject of site plan application D111619 located at the terminus of Cranberry Trail East in the town of Collingwood, subject to the following conditions to be fulfilled to the satisfaction of the Director of Planning Services. One, 
resolution of matters identified by staff and second submission site plan review comments for the subject lands dated October 2020. Two, satisfaction of town landscape architect peer review comments on the application for a permit to destroy trees, Appendix C. Three, provision by McPherson Builders, round bracket Cranberry Limited, of $250,000 in securities to be drawn upon at the discretion of the Director of Planning Services for related compensatory costs, including but not limited to, to tree replanting and or restoration of a temporary trail connection across the subject lands from Cranberry Trail to Georgian Trail if the owner fails to meet the performance requirements set out in the associated pre-development agreement. Uh, four, the owner enter into pre-development agreements that set out the performance requirements related to various commitments and terms under which securities may be drawn, including but not limited to a, the timing of complete installation of sewer infrastructure be undertaken by or before February 22, 2022. B, the temporary trail connection be constructed at the proposed location on the eastern extent of the subject lands at the outset of site servicing operations, where interruption to trail connection between Cranberry Trail and Georgian Trail is minimized to the greatest extent possible. C, the permanent trail connection be established by February 20, 2022. And D, the enhanced tree plantings comprised of an increased number of trees and species be planted and secured on the west side of the project, subject to related provisions and extensions where adequate performance has been demonstrated as applicable. And further, that the owner agrees to include within the forthcoming site plan agreement for Blue Fairway 5 and 6 site plan file D111619, a requirement that the McPherson Builders Round Bracket Cranberry Limited incorporate and agree to all related matters addressed in the aforementioned pre development agreement. And further, that in the event that Boundary tree removals and or off-site grading resulting in tree removals cannot be supported. The applicant submit a revised permit application uh, that, and that the Director of Planning Services be authorized to evaluate and issue the related permit subject to recommendations in Report 2021-4. The analysis contained therein and to the satisfaction of the Director of Planning Services. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, I have a request to speak and I've got you on my list, Deputy Mayor, but first I'm going to get this on the floor. So Councillor McLeod and Deputy Mayor Hall and go ahead, Deputy Mayor. Uh, thank you. I um, raised my card uh, to uh, simply get it on the table, but uh, I'd like to, if I may, uh, through you to uh, staff refer this item in its entirety uh back through staff to our uh, legal um department or our solicitors i guess i should say uh zeroing in on uh two items and it comes right from i guess the outset and it's the word suspend uh and it's in the context or in relation to bylaw 2012-084 uh, and i'm simply looking to get clarification from our solicitor that the process as it relates to the bylaw has been properly followed. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'll look for a seconder. Councillor Berman, thank you. This is a referral back to staff for clarification on the appropriate process. Uh, and I uh, understand the uh, Deputy Mayor's concerns. It is a referral, so there is no debate on the topic. Uh, so uh, with that being said then, I will call the vote in favor of referring this back to staff for clarification on the proper process whether it is under the bylaw or outside the bylaw. And with that, I will call the vote then. All in favor? Opposed? Duly noted, and that referral is carried. So that takes us then to item 9.2.2. Uh, which is P2021-5 P2020, extension of draft approval of plan of subdivision Bridgewater Preserve at Georgian Bay. 
And uh, Councillor Hamlin? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to ask a question of procedure. Um, I totally understand this matter that we've just uh, heard um, Director Farr and our resident speak on has been deferred back to staff for a specific uh, reason. Um, the questions we have of Director Farr, you know, with respect to his presentation, um, how will those be dealt with? We've referred it back for further information on this particular item of the process that we're implementing. And uh, so you will have an opportunity to ask those questions uh, when we come back to this item, when uh, staff reports back to council with the clarification on this particular item, because I think it may also impact on, on the questions and discussion that we have at that time. Thank you. Uh, so I need a mover and a seconder then for 9.2.2, moved by Councillor Jeffrey and seconded by Councillor Madigan. And I will uh, pass the baton to uh, Director Farr. Thank you. Is there a presentation there on, the, on this file? Uh, I'm not sure. Through the chair, I wasn't provided with one. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, uh, so this, uh, this uh, item was brought to uh, Development and Operations Committee. It deals with uh, the lands um, on Highway uh, 26 um, uh, near uh, uh, Princeton Shores. Uh, and uh, this is a, a draft plan of subdivision approval extension um, uh, that uh, contemplates uh, the development of uh, 320 odd uh, uh, townhouse uh, units in a group or cluster uh, uh, designation, an R3 designation. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this uh, subdivision has been extended a number of times um, in this case, the staff are uh, recommending the four month extension to allow for some uh, more detailed review of the existing conditions, primarily in the context of, uh, of the concurrent rezoning application that's been filed uh, on the property. A rezoning application has been filed on these lands that would rationalize the current zoning and allow for an increase in the units from uh, 300 odd uh, townhouses up into the 600 uh, unit range. Uh, that uh, number of, uh, uh, of uh, units would fall within the median density designation that uh, currently applies to the property. And the applicant has filed uh, a revision to the conditions of draft plan approval. As I indicated, uh, because of these uh, three different pieces, because of the complexity of the file, and frankly, because of uh, the, uh, the lack of resources relative to what all is going on in the community right now, we were uh, uh, recommending to uh, a committee and then to council that we be given a measure of more time to uh, follow up with uh, the proponent on their uh, zoning bylaw and then application and better understand their intent uh, with respect to these lands and uh, also uh, review uh, the current conditions and potential future conditions in their entirety in order to uh, uh, provide uh, the most well-rounded, well-considered recommendation to council on this matter. Thank you, Adam. So I'll read the recommendation, we'll get it on the floor. Uh, that staff report P2021-5, extension of draft approval for plan of subdivision Bridgewater Preserve at Georgian Bay be received. And that council extends the draft approval for the proposed Bridgewater plan of subdivision for a further four months to June 29, 2021. And the council directs staff to continue their review of the draft approval and bring forward a further recommendation report dealing with the development proposal prior to to the June 29, 2021 lapse date. Can I get a mover and a seconder, please? Moved by Councillor Berman, seconded by the Deputy Mayor. Uh, questions or comments, Council? 
Go ahead, Councillor Dory, and then Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll just uh, speak to the motion. Um, during standing committee, I did support this motion, but upon further consideration, uh, I have uh, changed my mind and I will not be supporting this uh, proposal. Um, the reason being that of all the development applications that we have in front of us, we they should be subject to the most up-to-date, the most stringent planning policies and not be based on a plan that was approved 14 years ago, albeit via OMB decision and has since sat on a shelf. Times change and climate changes. Water levels are at record high. Uh, um, climate change mitigation science has changed and has put increased value on green spaces and on wetlands for stormwater absorption and carbon sequestration. The list of species of concern or at risk has grown and at least three of them are known to inhabit the Silver Creek wetlands. Of all the proposed developments under consideration by this municipality, none have more potential ecological, social, and health implications than this one. Today, more than ever before, we must consider these merits along with just the planning merits. All of our, best, all of our development applications should have a best before date and presently they do not. We are fortunate in that we are on the eve of the release of a new official plan that will incorporate a year's worth of input from the public, staff, and council. So I ask why should we grant this approval against standards that are established under an outdated official plan? Uh, it's anticipated that the official plan review will also address matters that will serve to protect the town's interest better, such as expirations for draft plans. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dory. Councillor Hamlin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as you know, I did not support this at the committee. Um, and I continue to not support it. I uh, will not repeat, but I do endorse the comments of Councillor Doherty this evening. I think every draft plan needs a sunset date, as one of our deputants said at the committee. And uh, this one is the most egregious in our portfolio, so to speak. Uh, there's been continual extensions of draft plan approval for well over uh, 14 years and uh, there is nothing compelling about this that we should keep uh, extending approval while the landowner tries to figure out what it is that's going to happen on this property so i will not be supporting an extension of draft plan approval thank you thank you councillor hammond council any other questions or comments before i call the vote seeing none all in favor Opposed? And that is carried. That takes us to item 9.3, uh, motions. Uh, this is your motion, uh, Deputy Mayor. And I think there's updated wording. Read that in for you, Deputy Mayor, and then you can speak to your motion. So it's moved by Deputy Mayor. I'll ask for a second or once I've read it in. Be it resolved that the Standing Committee requests staff to review costs to replace the existing lights at Hamilton Drain with the traditional lights as installed at High Street and Chamberlain Crescent, and the potential cost to decommission and redeploy the existing lights to a more residential environment, reporting back to the Development and Operations Standing Committee. And we need to insert a date at that point uh, and further that given the current system was approved by the MTO that an invitation be sent to the ministry to visit the current installation to review their approved design in the context of concerns raised by the residents of the town of Collingwood. Um, 
Councilor Jeffrey is seconding it. So Deputy Mayor, would you like to uh, speak now? Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll be brief because I think it's uh, self-explanatory. Um, before I make my comments, I will though look to the CAO to perhaps provide the uh, date uh, to which she feels best that staff could uh, report back to development operations. Um, I would then further state that uh, for those watching along that uh, it starts by stating that uh, that's the standing committee and uh, just for a matter of process so we're at council this evening but uh, a notice of motion was put forward at uh, development and operations the report will come back to that particular committee and if it sees fit at that uh, committee to then move something forward um, that committee will do so far at that time uh, i think that um, a number of my colleagues around the table uh, have heard from a, a period of time and from uh, a wide-ranging uh, swath of residents uh, who either use the particular uh, crosswalk or drive through that particular crosswalk um, as it relates to um, the operation, the concerns as it relates to visibility, uh, et cetera. And I, I won't go into them in detail because I raised some concerns at development and operations, but. Uh, the, the rationale of the request as part of the second part of the motion to invite the MTO is really to say to staff that uh, I understand that the previous council, and I applaud the previous council for making a request and approving the budget to put in a crosswalk and a lights uh, a fixture there, and that staff using MTO guidelines worked within those parameters and installed what is there today. Um, I'm not an engineer, uh, engineer. I'm not a, 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 a transportation expert, uh, but when I view and when I see uh, what's happening there, uh, I have some concerns and some of them seem to be just common sense in terms of the physical layout, the use of amber versus red, the fact that we don't actually require vehicles to come to a complete stop, um, et, et cetera. And therefore, I think that it behooves the MTO in approving such a design that they come and actually take a look at the physical design in its use. And they themselves then can come to their own conclusions as to whether or not their engineering is, is correct. Uh, as I state, I'm not an expert, but when I look at it, I see some flaws that I think that they should take a look at. So all I'm asking tonight, I'm not asking for any eight around the table to come to a final conclusion. I'm just asking for further information. The information is in the request of costs so that we can then look as a council and say, is the cost associated with replacing uh, these particular light fixtures um, worth it within the budget that we have to work with? Uh, could the light fixtures that are currently there be redeployed elsewhere to better use and at what cost? And once we have that information, I think then we can uh, uh, make it, make a final determination as to the outcome of this particular crosswalk. And uh, I hope that uh, it receives full support and uh, leave it at there. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I'll look to uh, CAO Skinner for the date or potential date. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Deputy Mayor Hull. Uh, yes, I had to, had a good conversation with um, Director Slama and Manager Velik today. And uh, the date we would propose is no later than September. Uh, we're hoping it will be a bit earlier, but it does have some dependency on um, the uh, uh, how fast the new technician can get up to speed that, uh, thank you very much, Council had endorsed uh, for uh, uh, that type of work uh, in this year's budget. And uh, while I'm speaking, I'll just mention that I did also talk with uh, two of the, uh, the departments at MTO um, uh, since this uh, draft motion came forward, uh, being the uh, highway standards and the, uh, the traffic office. And they uh, indicated a uh, willingness to, um, uh, to, uh, to just to look at our experiences, whether they come physically or maybe just uh, look on the aerial photos and, and, and uh, discuss uh, the, our experiences with us. And also had indicated there are some flexibilities in the warrants to potentially move towards something like uh, uh, what is uh, suggested in this draft motion. Thank you. Thank you, CAO Skinner. So I've put in uh, for an insertion of the date by September 2021. 
And then I had uh, Councillor Jeffrey and then Councillor Hamlin. Go ahead, Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. So I agree with everything uh, that the, dep uh, the Deputy Mayor uh, said. My only question is what model of crosswalk uh, equipment is scheduled for Niagara and the Parkway? Um, uh, do we have Director Slama available? Welcome, Peggy. Thank you, Worship. That is a signalized uh, crosswalk. Okay. All right. Thank you. That's all. I just wanted to make sure we weren't having to investigate another one. That was That's great. Correct. <laughs> no. Thank you. This this is a signalized one. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm, you know, very supportive of this matter, and I just wanted to add a couple of facts, which was I got an, an email from a resident on February 18th, and, and I just want to tell you what it said. He saw an article in the paper about this issue uh, coming forward, and he said, we use that crossing every day. And the crosswalk signals are not stopping traffic. I think in many cases, because the drivers don't see them. We've had a couple of close calls there. You wait for one direction to stop so you can start across and the other direction of traffic does not. Something really needs to be done about this. Well, the very next day, the Sunday, my husband and I were in our car sitting at that uh, stop for a person to cross at that crosswalk heading towards Poplar. And as the person was crossing, two vehicles in a row going northbound barreled through the crosswalk <laughs> and, you know, totally oblivious to the person crossing us, in fact, stopped it, obviously, in the middle of the road and, and the lights going. So I just, you know, I had a couple of thoughts. One is to the extent staff can move up um, the look at, of this, I, looking at this, I think it would be helpful. And secondly, I'm so worried that um, perhaps having a crosswalk there is more dangerous than having none <laughs> because the pedestrians are thinking they've got a safe way to cross, but the cars aren't stopping. So, uh, you know, in that regard, all I can do is, is really leave it with staff to give some consideration to whether uh, that crosswalk should be removed pending uh, resolution of it. But otherwise, I'm in support of this motion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hamlin. I saw some uh, CAO Skinner nodding her head, uh, so I think she's taking your point. And Councillor McLeod, go ahead. Thank you. Just a point of clarification uh, following up on Councillor Jeffrey's question regarding what's going in at Niagara and the, the wording of the, of the motion. Uh, said is um, traditional lights, although I know there was an amendment and I don't have it right in front of me. Are we basically saying the, the ones that is being re requested to be looked at are like the ones at High and Chamberlain and that is also what we're thinking about for, or what we're hoping for uh, on uh, on Niagara and, and uh, 26? Uh, Deputy Mayor, you want to answer that? Um, well, I think uh, through you to uh, Director Slama, but if I understand correctly, what we passed in the budget to be installed on Niagara and the Parkway uh, is a, a traditional signal, signalized light with red, green, and amber, uh, and a flashing crosswalk sign for pedestrian use. And that is similar to what's um, installed at uh, Chamberlain and, and High. Yes, through the mayor, uh, that is correct. Great, so all these three are gonna be the same if, if this comes to pass. Uh, yes, terrific. Thank you for that clarification, I really appreciate it. Mr. Comey. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mayor. I, first of all, how exciting is it that our entire council is talking about crosswalks? This is awesome, this is fantastic. I, I want to, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I want to thank the Deputy Mayor, who was good enough to take some rather like intense phone calls from me while I've hung out at the crosswalk watching those transport trucks go by. And through you, I want to thank Director Slama and Manager Velik, who probably have a very special email file just to all the emails we forward along from residents having a myriad of concerns about crossing here have been spoken. But I also would like, this is a great opportunity to thank 
uh, Ms. Jennifer Parker, who uh, I thought of because of Councillor Hamlin's comments about people using the crosswalk who have spent time at the crosswalk showing our school children the right way to go across. And a very special thank you to our bylaw who came out immediately when it was down for several weeks and our local OPP and CAO Skinner and like the entire town gets behind this crosswalk as in general. So I think it's absolutely wonderful. And uh, so thank you Deputy Mayor for keeping this in the forefront and uh, to all the staff for bearing with us as we try to find the right solution. Thank you. Any other comments before I call the vote? Seeing none, all in favor? And that is carried unanimously. Thank you. This brings us to item 10 at 10.1 uh, development of legislation strengthening the definition of hate speech. And Director Calvers is going to join us. Uh, Dean, do you want to do your presentation? Then I'll read it in, or would you like me to read it in first? Uh, you're the mayor, <laughs> so whichever you choose is fine. Well, while I read it in, I'll give us context to the, to the uh, discussion. Sure. Whereas, whereas Canadians generally recognize the strength of community that is derived from embracing and appreciating all community members, regardless of ethnic origin, gender, and sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, or faith, and in accordance with statements made by the federal government, individual provinces, and the United Nations that hate speech has no place in an inclusive society that seeks to empower its constituents, whereas it is widely recognized that symbols can have a powerful and profound effect on the psychology and well-being of community members. Therefore, be it resolved that FCM petitioned the Canadian government to build on Parliament's 2019 report taking action to end online hate and engage in the development of legislation that would clarify and strengthen the definition of hate speech including explicit recognition of the psychological harm that can be caused by hate symbols and work with all levels of the government in addressing the root causes of hate speech. Go ahead, Dean. Thank you. Thank you for the time, Mr. Mayor. I, that allowed me to figure out how to share my screen, so I'm going to do that really quickly. I think, anyway, let me know if you can see this. Is that visible? There. Can you see a slide? Perfect, okay. So I thought it really quickly, I'd just, I'd just take us back. Uh, I know everybody is, is fairly intimately of, uh, aware of, of this time frame, uh, but this stemmed back to um, some concerns raised by residents back in June of 2020, uh, to which uh, council gave direction and we were able to respond with a, a staff report, which indicated at least as part of the report that uh, that we should uh, access FCM as a, uh, a lobby group to help us um, communicate with the federal government and seek some uh, change to legislation um, that would help us to manage uh, symbols of hate, hate expressions in the community and hate symbols. Um, so what's happened, uh, Go back to that report, we, we were unable to, because I think the deadline for the uh, to meet the last board meeting of 2020 uh, was around July 11th. We were too late to submit to FCM uh, after uh, the July 29 report. So the next opportunity to ha to meet the with the uh, or sorry to provide a resolution to the uh, board of FCM uh, is uh, March 18th. So we've done that. We uh, we submitted it before January 11th. And then the next part of the process is the STM staff actually provide some, some feedback, um, both looking at the uh, resolution as pertains to FCM policy, but also uh, with their own uh, insights and research into uh, the matter at hand. Uh, so actually last week I was contacted by FCM staff who provided actually some, some really critical uh, insight into what's going on at the federal level uh, at Parliament. Um, and it was encouraging because it, it talks to the point that um, the federal government is addressing or looking to address definition of hate speech. Um, and uh, their, But their focus is a little bit towards um, what's happening online. Um, and again, I won't speculate further because I, I don't know enough, but it's encouraging at least that we are talking at least in the same realm. Um, we do believe there's still validity for uh, pursuing and caring for forward a resolution through FCM. Uh, so uh, staff, uh, the FEM staff provided some, uh, some guidance and some recommendations, which you see before you in the, 
the recommendation that um, that Mayor, Mayor Saunderson just read. And uh, with your approval, uh, this will go to the FCM board on March 18th. If adopted by the FCM board, it will form part of their policy position and be a, a, a policy pursuit for the next three years uh, for FCM. So I'm happy to take any questions, um, but hopefully that little background recap and uh, um, explanation helps. Thank you, Dean. Uh, first, I'll just get a mover and a seconder to get this motion on the floor. I move by Councillor Hamlin, seconded by Councillor Jeffrey. Uh, questions or comments, Council? Councillor Hamlin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you uh, to uh, Director Culver. Um, I'm, this is uh, fantastic. I like the wording of the motion. Um, my question is, in your discussions with FCM staff, um, did you have the sense that if the board adopted this, uh, that FCM would then have the ability to work with the federal government on this legislation, which, as you indicated, is address, addressing online hate, <laughs> um, to try and broaden that particular piece of legislation to encompass the symbol? Uh, issue that we've had in our community. Dean? So uh, through you, Mayor, I, I, um, I think that's the intent of the resolution, but I'll defer to Councillor Jeffrey, um, who has experience at the board level and will probably explain better than I can. Councillor Jeffrey. Um, thank you, Mayor Saunderson, through to Councillor Hamlin. Um, the uh, process that Dean showed you uh, kind of stopped at the board approval. But what happens is, is um, our policy advisors at FCM cannot move forward with a file unless the board approves it. So once the board approves it, that uh, wording that it becomes part of our policy means that these outstanding policy people will be pursuing the federal government with this. and. Um, by the time that they've spent with us and getting the wording just right, I'm assuming they've worked toward uh, what we call a category uh, concur or category A concurrence, which, uh, um, and I see no reason with FCM's current um, uh, policies that are already in place that they're working on in other ways that this would not fit into ours. So I think it'll be very supportable, but all staff needs is board the board support and then um, they uh, start engaging with the right ministers and the right uh, highly placed uh, staffing. Uh, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you for that answer. And if I could have a follow up uh, through you, Mayor Saunderson, uh, to Councillor Jeffrey, would there be an opportunity to, for feedback to our council as the FCM uh, process unfolds? I'll be I'll be able to report to council immediately after the board meeting because I will be part of that vote, and um, I have explained to um, Director Culver uh, through you, Mayor Saunderson, that part of the process is um, quite often they look to a board member who is uh, a member of council of a sponsoring. Uh, municipality and so I've asked him to make sure that he has me prepared with his top three key points for me to make at the board and I will do so. Okay, thank you. Councillor Comey. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and, and through you and thank you to Director Culver for, for your slide and your explanation. Uh, I am in favor of the uh, added wording but through you mr mayor to Councillor jeffrey who will be in attendance the meeting i just do want to pick up on what Councillor hamlin said that really what came before our community wasn't explicitly a concern based out of online hate although i'm sure this council agrees that's incredibly concerning we even have members of our own community who are targeted through online hate groups so i i fully support the notion of, of their importance but really this entire petition and what came before us started with concern over the flying of a Confederate flag. And I just don't want that to be lost or diluted. So I'm hoping that with you being present at the table and being you know, acutely aware of the staff report and our community's concerns that that in itself is not lost, that we still have this as an outstanding painful issue in our community that, that still last I checked is still flying and it's incredibly hurtful to our entire community. So I just, 
I look forward to hearing back from you on that. And I hope that message isn't lost when it, when it gets before the board. Thank you. Councilor Jeffrey, any comments? Yeah, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. So through you to Councillor Comey, uh, for sure that will not be lost, which was my point in having um, our director, um, Director Culver, make sure that I had the speaking notes they want me to touch on in terms of that. And I believe their wording has covered that off. Um, and it is quite uh, beneficial to be piggybacking on something that is already happening at the federal level. This will make it much easier. So um, I'm quite prepared to cover that off. Uh, off there and actually I, I didn't wait for this opportunity I had um, uh, the chance to um, have some work with a, another minister and I brought up uh, some of our problems particularly with the signage at uh, the corner of uh, Huron and here Ontario and uh, Part of her speech had been empowering municipalities and I, I told her in my question that I was glad to hear that they wanted to empower municipalities that we can't manage within it with, with the tools we have right now and I brought up that specific example so that advocacy has already started. Thank you Councillor. Thank you and through you uh, Mr. Mayor I just want to offer my um, my thanks to the heart for the hard work that uh, acting executive director Culver has put into this file. He really took the bit <laughs> and ran uh, with this. And and even uh, this past um, weekend, I uh, I may have shared this with a couple of uh, of my colleagues. There have been um, stories uh, from other municipalities where. Uh, this conversation has taken place and went a different way. And uh, I'm just so pleased that every time this discussion comes to this council, it's almost always, a, it, no, it's always been a unanimous vote for diversity, inclusion, and uh, love and peace. And I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased uh, to see that. And I'm really pleased to see the work that our staff has done and is willing to do. Didn't have to be ordered to do it and thank you and certainly add to that the work with the diversity collective it's been uh, extremely productive and thank you to all of those members again for their input deputy mayor go ahead um thank you i i too would echo the comments of my uh, colleagues who have spoken uh to this matter uh i too would also um specifically uh, applaud the work of uh, Executive Director Culver. And uh, it was nice to kick off the meeting tonight with uh, Marcia Alderson uh, speaking as one, uh, a member of the, um, uh, the, the new inclusive group that's been put together. And uh, if you haven't had a chance, she referenced uh, the articles that have been uh, published in Collingwood today. And I think Jessica Owens has done an excellent job in um, providing a sense of uh, who uh, the organization or who this committee uh, is rep represented by, uh, their backgrounds, both those who have been generational within our community or those who are perhaps uh, more recent, not only to the community, but to the country from places uh, like Sri Lanka, for example. Um, I, I just would want to uh, pass along a comment through you to our chair at FCM. And it is sort of along the lines of uh, Councillor Hamlin and Councillor Comey. Uh, as Councillor Comey was uh, speaking, I put up my fingers like that. And I apologize, I wasn't being rude. What I was putting my fingers up was the fact that uh, there are two flags that still fly in this community, not one. It's been a lot of attention paid to one, but there are two. Um, and the comment that I would just make through to our representative at FCM is that uh, it, it amazes me that so many uh, lower municipalities across Canada are grappling with this issue. Uh, and we have a federal government in the throes of a pandemic. And so therefore, I, I, cut, them, <laughs> I cut them some slack because uh, we're all dealing with it. But they had no issue in adding certain names to a list uh, at the drop of a hat. And I just, I, I question, what is it? that our federal government doesn't seem to get or want to do specific to this issue because really they are the ones the only ones as it relates to the symbol itself in terms of creating legislation that then can withstand 
charter challenges that are going to come down the pipe. And uh, I, I just leave it at that because it, I applaud the effort that everyone is making, whether it be here in Collingwood, whether it be in the city of Cambridge, where, wherever. But until the federal government actually steps up and creates legislation that then can be put into law, and if somebody wants to challenge it, well, that's their right uh, under the Constitution. But uh, then and only then can we, uh, uh, as a local municipality, be able to actually take action and, and remove these symbols. So um, anyway, thank you. No, get down off my soapbox. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I have Councillor Berman and then Councillor Jeffrey. Thank you, Mayor Saunderson. I just thought about when the Deputy Mayor explained the two. Um, and I, I just, I want to see if this will show up if I hold it up. This is the view from my front porch today. And I think everybody on council knows where I live, maybe not the two staff. Um, Dean, can you just maybe follow up the Deputy Mayor's comment on what it would take to get something done about this, why it's not a, an easy fix? Okay. Yeah, through, through your worship, um, effectively, uh, it's outside of the municipal jurisdiction and because of um, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and the, the, broad, um, um, the broad understanding or broad legal definition of what is free speech in uh, Canada, um, we don't have the power uh, to take um, uh, to take uh, to remove the flag if it uh, if it seemed to be removed. So then um, we need to have some some methodology or some uh, tools provided by the federal government uh, through legislation that would allow the municipality to take action. Thanks, Dean. Any follow up, Councilor Berman? Okay, Councilor Jeffrey. Uh, thank you, Mayor Saunders. And so just directly to, to the Deputy Mayor, I'd like to thank the clout, particularly facing an election period where um, an organization that represents over 90% of the Canadian population in 2,000 municipalities would have the clout to have them listen. And um, that's, uh, that's the very essence of FCM. So um, I'm looking forward to seeing what, uh, what they can do. Thank you. Any other questions, comment, Council? It's been a good discussion. Deputy Mayor. So I say this with tongue in cheek, but uh, I 100% agree with you, Councillor Jeffrey. And uh, in saying that, then no pressure. There's no pressure on you. No effect. We'll call the vote then. All in favor. And that is carried unanimously. Uh, notices of motion, item 11, notices of motion. Are there any notices in Councillor Jeffrey? Go ahead and uh, Councillor Hamlin, I think this, uh, I, she's just reading in the notice, but if you'd like to recuse yourself, you certainly can. Oh, thank you, Mayor Saunderson. Uh, so this is regarding a capitant's request for, um, for funding. Am I getting feedback? Uh, we can hear you. I'll turn okay. Whereas the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay, here and after referred to as the Institute, is purpose to connect and engage the talents and aspirations of all residents in collaborative ways in five interconnected priority areas, arts and culture, business and innovation, social justice, health and well-being, and the environment. And whereas the goals of the Institute are favorably aligned with our Town of Collingwood strategic goals contained in the community-based strategic plan to promote sustainability locally and regionally. And whereas the Institute is facilitating an educational series compelled by the issues surfacing during the pandemic and focusing on building collaborative efforts towards a sustainable future for generations to come. Therefore, be it resolved that Council authorize partnership support in the amount of $2,500 to the Institute of Southern Georgian Bay to support this series, which will match the Institute's financial investment. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. So we'll be dealing with that in our first meeting in March. Um, Sarah, if you can just let uh, Councillor Hanlon know we're, we're moving on. And that brings us to item 12, 12.1, uh, 12 any old or deferred business council? Seeing none, 12.2 other business and 12.2.1 uh, is an International Women's Day presentation. Councillor Comey. 
Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm sure that uh, Stephanie will teed up. I've done it as a video this year. Oh, I'm getting feedback to you, Mr. Mayor, if you wouldn't mind. Can you make it? Um, I made a video this year. I am no video wizard, but I hope you enjoy it. I would like to take a moment to really thank Clerk Olmes. I don't know how many of you know, but when I first came to her with the idea of the town recognizing this day, she was incredibly supportive and she facilitated a meeting with uh, then CAO Amin, who of course was also incredibly supportive. So I really want to take a moment to thank Clerk Olmes for being right there from the beginning and Deputy Clerk Stahl, who was really behind the super cool flag design that will go up uh, very soon in honor of International Women's Day. And again, the entire town, all the committee, the event organizers, um, so many of you have attended the events. They have been passionate and incredible and, and very, very important. So I thank you all. I won't take any of your time, but uh, I, please be sure to join us for International Women's Day. You're broken down and tired of living life on the merry-go-round. And you can't find a fighter, but I see it in you, so we can walk it out. Move mountains, we can walk it out and move. Silence is in quiet, and it feels like it's getting hard to breathe. And I know you feel like dying, but I promise we would take the world to its feet. Move, I won't take, bring it to its feet. Thank you for that. And I know this year there's a special edition with the Jordan uh, Municipal Support uh, Project. And Councillor Jeffrey, maybe you'd like to speak a bit to that. It would be my pleasure. Thank you, uh, Mayor Saunderson. So I, as I reported to Council, I was uh, appointed as the governance uh, rep to the Jordan Project. It's FCM's only international program in the Middle East. And just before Christmas, it occurred to me that um, our event was virtual and uh, what was the possibility of having some of the Jordan women uh, join us in our event um, as participants and as our staff developed it, it turned out that they, we have two that are going to be panelists and I think uh, what we speak to or spoke to in our meetings between the two staffs, FCM staff and our event staff um, was the fact that despite our geographies, the issues and challenges um, and opportunities are very similar and that uh, this will bring some solidarity uh, for the women in Jordan and some great understanding for us uh, here in Canada and in little old Collingwood. So we're being featured highly at FCM and I'm very appreciative to all the work that Karen Cubitt and, and Rosemary and uh, Amanda and the whole team did uh, in um, welcoming um, this uh, addition value added to our event. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jeffrey. It will be a good event, a great event. That brings us to item 13.1. Uh, oh, before I move on, is there any other bit, other business? Just 
make sure I've gone through and seeing none and we'll move on to the in-camera item, item 13. Uh, whereas the clerk hereby concurs the reasons for the in-camera session have been duly reviewed and considered and the matters are authorized under the exception provisions to conduct a closed session in accordance with the Municipal Act prior to proceeding into closed session. Therefore, be it resolved that this council proceeds in camera in order to address the matter pertaining to one, the security of the property of the town or local board, item B, two, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposal of land for town or local board purposes, item A, and three, a position, plan, procedure, criteria, or instruction to be applied to any negotiations carried on or be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board, and that's item B. And the matters for discussion today are A, land sale, Beach Street Lane, and B, New Tecumseh Improvement Society. A mover and a seconder, please, Council. Moved by Councillor Madigan, seconded by Councillor Berman. All in favor? That is carried unanimously. And uh, Council, it's now uh, 725. We'll take a 10 minute bio break and we will reconvene at uh, 735 for the in camera session. And just a reminder there is a separate link for the in camera this evening, and then we will rise and report back through this meeting. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for that. So we will be back in 10 minutes then. Thank you, Council. streets are not any more uh, accessible as a through street. So every time you get to an intersection, you're forced to turn, to go over to say here Ontario, um, so that you can use that street to head straight north, south through town. But a street like Maple Street um, would no longer be a, uh, a shortcut. Um, you know, for people to use to cut through town. It would be a place where kids could, uh, you know, learn to ride their bikes in the street, where street hockey would be um, easy to play because you wouldn't be stopping for a car every two minutes. Uh, a place where neighbors would feel comfortable letting their kids play in their front yard, not just in their back. Uh, and so those are the kinds of things that I think we should be thinking about as we move through this pandemic and into the time afterward where we need to be considering how our public space is being utilized. Um, and that I think is the thing that, that if we can take anything away from this, it's the realization that the largest public asset that any community has is our streets. That's the largest single outlay of public space. And when we dedicate them only to one use, I think we rob people of the opportunity to use those streets as uh, you know, an extension of the front yard, a place that can connect people rather than drive them apart. Um, when we're talking about creating a great bike friendly city, we need to make sure that we're thinking for all seasons. Um, and especially here in Collingwood, we know that we have uh, kind of, you know, challenging winters. Uh, you know, we get lots of snow, we get thaws, we get ice. Um, but there are cities around the world that have similar or worse winters than we do. And they manage to, uh, to hang on to a lot of people cycling every single year because they maintain a lot of their pathways and their network to a standard that people uh, can ride all year round. You know, I always tell people no one would buy a Toyota Corolla if we didn't plow our roads for the winter, right? It'd be kind of like, oh, snow's flying, put the Corolla away, get the Hummer out. Um, you know, if you, if you aren't maintaining the infrastructure for the types of vehicles that you want to see, don't be surprised when those vehicles aren't usable. So we need to think about how we can make our winter network um, not quite as robust as our summer network. We don't need to have every single trail and every single road maintained, but we need some priority corridors that can be connected and um, designated as winter routes. The number one thing that we need though here in Collingwood is not a bunch of new infrastructure. It's not new trails, it's not new bike lanes, it's none of that. And the number one thing that we need 
is human resources. We need people that are going to be willing to bring all of the fantastic groups that are working on active transportation in Collingwood together. You know, we've got groups like the Collingwood Cycling Club, like Cork, um, like the Trails Committee, like our service clubs, like our active and safe routes to school groups. And there's all these amazing people doing all this amazing work, but too often they're not communicating with one another. They're not talking, they're not identifying common goals and identifying places where they can be sharing resources and building a stronger culture of cycling here in Collingwood. And so uh, we were going to launch a bike mayor program uh, at the uh, Outdoor Edit Speaker Series where we're going to look at nominations and, and getting someone who can, as a on a volunteer level, um, serve as the ambassador for cycling in Collingwood, someone who can bring all those different communities together. And so uh, we are still going to try and do this. It's not something that we're going to shell, but I just encourage you to uh, think about someone in your life who is incredibly passionate about riding a bike in Collingwood and uh, who would be a great uh, nominee for bike mayor because we, we would love to, uh, to see one come forward. Um, and I, I'm going to close with this, uh, just that people are creatures of habit. Uh, we need to give people the opportunity to create new habits. And um, we're all going through a bit of, a, of, of an adjustment period right now. Um, you know, a lot of the old habits and uh, ideas that we had are, are obviously being thrown for a bit of a loop. And so we have an opportunity, a unique opportunity to take a minute and consider what is really working in our lives, what's providing us happiness, what's providing us joy, um, and how can we craft a life um, coming out of this and a community coming out of this that fits how we want it to look rather than how it has looked. Um, I think that that's a really tremendous opportunity and I think it would be a shame if we didn't uh, follow it. Um, I always close my presentation about Collingwood with this picture. This is my friends, Adam and Laura. These are two friends that I made literally from the saddle of a bike. Uh, and uh, I can count the number of friends that I've made from behind a windshield uh, on zero hands. I don't have a single friend that I've ever made uh, from behind the windshield of a car, but some of the most consequential friendships that I've ever made uh, came about because of bikes. And so I think that, you know, when we're trying to build a more connected, more compassionate community, um, getting out and, and being physically present in that community, whether we're on our bike, whether we're walking, whether we're wheeling, um, just as long as we're there, we're physical, we're present, uh, and we're presenting our true face to the world. I think that that is really the way forward to, uh, to build out of this. Um, thank you so much. And uh, I'm really excited to, uh, to hang out and listen to Tara and Peter. So. Awesome. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, all right, so uh, next up we have Tara Blaine Hunt, uh, former crashed ice competitor, owner of Anytime Fitness here in Collingwood, entrepreneur, angel investor, kind of one of the coolest women that I've had the privilege of meeting in the past few years. She's amazing. She's going to be speaking about her journey with nutrition, uh, how we have an amazing opportunity to focus on local producers right now, and why that matters for our local economy as well as for our health. So. Tara, I am going to turn it over to you here. Thank you so much, Molly, for that warm introduction. Uh, I'm just gonna share my screen with you all. So it is such a pleasure to be a part of the virtual summit series and to be here with you all tonight. I'm gonna be talking about a four letter F word that we all know, love, but sometimes dislike. Now, some of you might be thinking, is she really going to swear during her talk tonight? Funk, no. The four-letter word I'm going to be talking to you about tonight is one that without, there would be no life. And with no life, there would be no love. A four-letter word that you and I have had the pleasure to touch, see, hear, smell, and taste. Can anyone guess what that four letter F word is that I'm talking about? Drum roll, please. Food. According to Hippocrates, the father of medicine, food is our medicine. And tonight we are going to explore what this means and why it is important to get back to basics when it comes to our healthy food and the opportunity that we have 
to come together as a community stronger than ever. Now this talk has the potential to be beneficial to everyone on the call tonight, especially those of you who struggle or who have struggled with sports performance due to improper nutrition, energy and or weight management, you know, that feeling of needing caffeine, chocolate, or other sugary pick-me-up, potential sacrifice mental performance and irritated behavior, as well as connection with oneself, others, and or nature. So here's a little bit more about me. My husband, Ed, and I are partners in Anytime Fitness, and we met actually back in 2003 while working as recreation therapists at Waypoint Center for Mental Health. It was actually during the SARS outbreak. Yes, I am an angel investor with humble beginnings. I actually lived in my car while supporting myself from the age of 16. Consequently, I am a half credit shy of receiving my high school diploma, but that's a discussion for another day. Being the oldest female to qualify and compete in Red Bull Crash Ice, I got to experience what it feels like to fly. I will never forget skating to the starting gates of my first Red Bull race, looking out over St. Paul, Minnesota, where Anytime Fitness's head office location is held. There were over 100,000 people in the crowd with the cathedral as our backdrop. I knew if I could land this 20-foot drop, I could do anything, including sharing my struggle with a Zoom room full of friends and friends of friends. I know that we are all connected. So like a caterpillar morphs into a butterfly, my intention, in fact, my life's purpose is to help others, maybe even you, learn to fly, but without the 20-foot drop. So if we're gonna fly together, we had better warm up first. So I'm gonna get to you guys too, and I can't see your video, but I'm gonna trust that you're standing up with me right now, and we're gonna squat down like we're sitting in a chair, and then reach up to the ceiling, and then do it again. Squat down, and then reach, and then last time, three times a charm, and reach. Thankfully, your videos aren't on, so I can't see your pajamas. Okay, so if health, if healthy food is our medicine, then the opposite must be true. And for me, this is less of a question, and it's more of my life story. Here's my secret. To this day, I struggle with all of these things. Growing up, I was exposed to a lot of very unhealthy eating habits from my parents, my extended family, the media, television, and magazines, and the quote unquote nutrition experts. I didn't know how, what, why, or when to eat. And so some days I did eat, and some days I didn't. You would never know by looking at this photo from 1995 that the year prior, I was awarded Athlete of the Year thanks to a total of seven Georgia Bay Championships titles. Sports were my outlet to my internal struggle with food. And so in 2000, I set out to make peace with my unhealthy eating habits and get to the core of what it meant to fuel the body, the mind, and the spirit. While working nights at a local factory, I came across a new version to the sport of triathlon, the Xterra Off-Road Adventure Triathlons. There were two races back to back within 900 kilometers of each other, one in Whistler and one in Hood River. I rationalized that I could fly into Vancouver, ride my bike to Oregon, and catch a return flight out of Portland. No more fake it till you make it, I thought. The moment of truth was about to unfold and unfold it did. Despite all of my preparation, improvements to nutrition, training and coaching, by the time I made it to the run of the Whistler course, I bombed, completely and utterly ran out of gas. I had to walk the entire 10K trail run. With no one to blame, 
about myself, the negative self-talk crept in. What was I thinking? A rebellious kid from Ontario trying to compete in the big leagues, a professional endurance sport. Give up on your dream of being greater, better version of yourself, Tara. Go back to normal. The only problem was, I didn't even know what normal was. And then this happened. At the almost halfway mark between my ride from BC to Oregon, I got two flat tires and had to take shelter for the night under a picnic table, just outside of Olympia, Washington. Early the next morning, I awoke to the loud sounds of a mountain lion warning its prey, me, stay back or I'll attack. Please let me live, lion, I remember saying, although quiet enough as to not to provoke the hungry cat. My life has meaning, and although I don't know what the meaning of my life is, I promise I will figure it out. Let me live, little kitty. Please don't eat me. No sooner after the commitment to myself and the fat cat was made, the lion went away, and I was left to continue on my journey. When I got into town that morning, I was greeted by a utopian-like community of fellow cyclists, community gardens, art, culture, local currency, and a feeling of community connected with nature. This was the fuel that I needed to finding my life's purpose. That weekend in Hood River, I had the best triathlon race experience of my life. I can still remember the smell of the air, the feeling of rolling through the single track mountain bike course, and the pure appreciation of my body connecting to the earth with each stride along the run. When I crossed the finish line, to my surprise, I heard my name announced over the loudspeaker. And in third place, all the way from Ontario, Canada, Tara Blaine. Despite my complete and utterly disappointing finish at last weekend's race in Whistler, I persevered and made podium. This was no longer about a triathlon course. No, this was way bigger than that. This was, this was about my life's course. The matter of life's meaning and life's meaning to matter. And so for 20 years, I've been researching and experimenting with food as my medicine. And to spare you all the head and heartache, sleepless nights and worrisome days I've had, I've compiled a very keep it simple list of ways that you too can benefit from food. First things first, rise and shine with lemon water. It's like shower on the inside. Number two is to practice an attitude of gratitude. Hold hands, say grace, be thankful for each day. Number three is to put your body into a state of rest and digest the parasympathetic nervous system, not fight or flight, by eating within 60 minutes of waking. Slow down to speed up metabolism. Give leptin, our satiety hormone, the time that it needs to release and signal to your body that you're full. You know, fat got a bad rap, and it's actually like the internet or the Wi-Fi for our body, so it can send signals to and from, from one area to the other. Number six, and this is one that I really struggled with, and that is to eat colorful fruits and vegetables and to consider fruit as nature's candy. The more color, the more likely you're getting a balance of nutrients and vitamins. For number seven, for me as an A blood type, I eat mostly vegetarian. However, if you're an O, According to the science, your protein is better sourced from meat, which leads me into number eight. By sourcing locally grown and raised food, not only are you supporting our local economy, you're also supporting your local ecosystem, your immune system. Together, we can make healthy happen. Together, we can create our own utopia. Imagine a town where everyone bikes to the local farmer's market, a place where people come together to share, to grow, to learn, to enjoy local food, music, art, ideas, a place where we can stay, play, create, and care about one another. 
all for one and one for all. We are stronger together. And although we don't know how long we have to practice social distancing, we the people have the ability to come together and support each other through our local food chain. So here's a list of local healthy food providers. And we will be sharing this list with you and ask if you know of others, please share as well. By supporting our local ecosystem, as mentioned, you're supporting your immune system. Right now and always, healthy food is our best offense to defend disease. We can do this. As unhealthy habits unfold, it's easy to get confused, it's easy to get discouraged, and it's easy to feel alone. Remember me and the mountain lion? Follow Anytime Fitness on social media and join a community of like-minded individuals who are facing the challenge just like you and I. Together, we can make healthy happen. I want to thank you all tonight. Namaste. Awesome. Well, excited to sort of close the show out tonight. Uh, hopefully, I won't be too long here. I know everyone wants to get going and stuff. So, But thank you for being here tonight, and thank you for uh, listening to all of us. Um, but what I want to talk about was indeed sort of about movement, you know, that we've been touching on this in different ways tonight. Um, but I thought as from a kinesiologist standpoint, from, you know, my work in endurance coaching uh, with adults, um, I wanted to talk a bit about movement tonight and sort of what that means even beyond sort of working out and training. Um, the best way to talk about what I do uh, is to sort of through the people and some of the images, right? So I think that's where the impressive stuff is and where people get out and really shine and go on adventures. And so I have clients like this who are, you know, busy people, you know, maybe working in healthcare, you know, have families, you know, have the normal sort of responsibilities of life, but are able to put in time, you know, over a consistent amount of months and years um, so that they can build up and do things like this is a hundred mile gravel race. Um, you know, and, and this is just makes me smile watching, um, you know, this this client just distancing herself from all these men. Um, it's just you're really cool. And just like all these training and all the stories behind that um, are really cool. Um, this picture is not coming in quite as well, but it's uh, another client who's, you know, going to university, really busy, um, you know, riding technical trails, believe it or not. Um, this is another female client who's, you know, learning how to jump and as an adult woman, you know, conquering fears and, you know, really getting through that. And so it's this really cool stuff that, you know, again, building over time, nothing, you know, huge, but it's these small wins and confidence building, uh, sort of experiences, right. That we're getting through sport. Um, this is another group, a local club, not unlike our local club here in Collingwood Cork, um, you know, and they're learning about mountain bike skills and they're just trying to get out there and figure out mountain biking and riding better so that they can get out and ride with their friends, um, you know, enjoy the forest, be safe as adults um, and, and as kids, right? This one actually has younger clients as well, um, which is great. And this is a, another client who's a teacher, um, but he's actually one of the best masters mountain bike racers in, in the country, if not the world. We just had world championships in this past year. Um, and so he's been training probably over 20 years at least now. And, and I thought that part of the reason that this was good to sort of just sort of highlight these people doing really amazing, like high level things um, was that, you know, everything was going really good. The winter was really, really good. I was getting pretty excited that everyone, you know, most people were, were rolling along pretty well here. Um, and then, you know, obviously um, you probably felt a bit of this as well. It felt like the treadmill just abruptly stopped and we were all sort of slammed into the ground. Um, you know, whatever our goals were, whatever we were hoping to do this spring. Um, and so I, I thought, you know, Justin alluded to this, Molly's alluded to this, this opportunity we have that we've all sort of just been slammed into the ground and sort of the, the treadmill of life, if you will, um, has sort of come to a pause in a lot of ways, for better or worse. And there's obviously a lot of really troubling and a lot of really hard things right now. Um, but we also have this pause where we, we have to revisit. I'm sure in your day-to-day -day life, there's been changes where you're maybe at home more, you know, you maybe have more time to get out and walk or maybe not. Um, you maybe had a great training routine and maybe that's been disrupted and you've seen that change. Uh, you're maybe cooking at home more. I imagine you're not, you know, as easily going out and getting fast food, right? So there's a lot of positives, negatives, possibilities for changes that we're looking at as far as health and nutrition and lifestyle. Um, 
and, and it could go either way. It could be improving things in some ways. It could be not improving things in some ways. But I think this has been a great leveling where regardless of the, the client I'm working with or the person I'm working with, um, there's this opportunity for changes impetus that we're all sort of thrown into the ground um, and, and we're sort of trying to rebuild and, and build these habits now. And so whether you're like one of my clients, you know, whether you're trying to get ready for the group ride, you're trying to get really set up to go for big rides um, on the weekends, or you are aspiring to something, you know, big races in the future. Um, I, I think it's worth thinking about this as an opportunity. Again, acknowledging the, the tough times that are ahead and, and that we are in, um, but looking at this time, and for the, the athletes that I do work with, we've been sort of coming back to this idea of you are an athlete and there is an, an opportunity here um, for us to have some control. Um, you know, if we have, I have this diagram here, it's actually from the seven habits, uh, highly effective people, but there's this idea of there's things we can control and there's things we can't control. Um, there's a lot right now we can't control. That's the big outer circle. Um, but inside, there's some elements of your day that you can control. Some of us don't have a lot. Some of us, it might be, you know, just small motions. It might be our attitude that we're, we're bringing to things. Um, for some of us, there might be a lot of the day free uh, that we do control. And if we think about ourselves as an athlete, then there's things like goals as far as, you know, our, what we're doing every day. We're planning our workouts. We're maybe planning when we're going to go for a walk. Um, you know, our nutrition is something we have more control probably than we've had in the past and, and less distractions than we've had in the past and for a lot of us. Um, so I want you to think about some of that opportunity as things that you can control um, and, and some of that stuff that we, we're concerned about, but is, you know, a little bit beyond our control largely, right? Um, and trying to think of your exercise, your movement as a way to feel like you're making progress in some things, to feel like you're... Um, you know, able to control something in life. And I think for a lot of us, that's a, an empowering message, right? The, the idea with exercise is that, you know, you always, people will say, you got to get started. You got to get started. And that's easy if you're into exercise, I think, to get out the door often, you know, you can figure that out. But I think the message that movement versus even exercise is, is our goal. Whether we're a hard charging athlete trying to do 100 mile gravel races or we're someone who's just trying to take those first literal steps to exercise, um, doing something is, is worthwhile, right? That's messaging we're seeing that like, whether it's mental health, whether it's blood uh, sugar control, weight management, bone health, um, our sleep at night, if we can get out and walking, if we can we're use the stairs, if we can do a workout, great. If we can join into a Zoom meeting and do a workout or something, um, that's that's all amazing stuff, but the key is that we start and we start slow. There's no need that for it to be a huge, you know, massive workout. You don't have to be super sore the next day. And in fact, it's better if you're, you know, oh, I felt better. Just like Justin said, um, you know, if we all are feeling better when we're moving in some ways, it doesn't have to be something official like a workout. It can definitely be movement through the house, through around the house. Um, there's this sort of mindset, you know, we've seen on TV, The Biggest Loser or something like that, where, you know, it seems like everyone's just like really breathing hard all the time and, you know, do lifting for hours and exercising for hours and running marathons. And that's, that's great if that's what you're into and you enjoy that. And you might get there, like Molly alluded to in her talk, for those of us that are starting and even those of us that are trying to deal with this more inside, more sedent, sedentary <laughs> um, it, living, right? We're not able to walk around the city. We're not able to maybe even commute to work anymore. Trying to build in some of these little movements uh, into our day, into our house are, are important. I put the, the turtle there. This is from the labyrinth here in Collingwood. I challenge you to go for a walk and find it if you haven't found it. Um, it's in Harborview Park. Uh, the turtle's there, and I always, uh, I don't, I wouldn't say I meditate, but when I ride by it or I run by it or we walk by it, it does remind me of this idea of consistency over time rather than no pain, no gain. So as you're pursuing movement, I want you to remember that turtle. Um, these couple of images here, so we're talking about moving at home in these small motions, right? On the one side here, we have a lady, uh, that's actually Katie Bowman, who has a couple of great books around sort of this idea of mini movements and movements built into our day that aren't necessarily exercise, but movements that are built into things that we do. We're very good at outsourcing. We have cars to drive us places. We have people that deliver our food to us. Um, you know, we have blenders to blend our food. Everything is getting easier. Um, and, and she's been very good at, I think, 
showing how you know we can make life a little harder, a little more challenging, and build some of these movements into our day. So if you're someone who's working from home right now, can you do a couple hours where maybe you're seated or standing or you know mix that up? Um, so that's the one image, and then we have the other one of stairs, right? A lot of us have stairs, and those are a great thing that you know we can go up and down the stairs between meetings. Um, we can incorporate that into a workout with something like Tara did squats today. Um, you know, so now you've got squats. We've already started. We got our workout done for today. Tomorrow, maybe some stairs plus the squats that Tara had you do uh, would be a first step into you know gradually progressing. Um, a couple more ideas here. We have sort of a more formal family workout. A lot of my clients, some of the ones that are even pictured, are, are you know having to come with to terms with the kids are home. And so what we used to do, you know, one hour on our indoor trainer or a treadmill or our home gym or, you know, going to the gym. Now you have to deal with the, you know, little kids, the dogs, the spouse is around. And we're all sort of just like in this captive environment, right? And the clients that are doing the best with this are maybe still doing some, you know, formal exercise training. They're getting their workout in. Um, but they're also including their kids in a portion of it or the kids are also like doing a little bit with it. Um, and I think the ones that are doing the best is they're actually starting letting the kids participate and, and even plan some of it. The kids are, are really good at planning at obstacle courses and games of tag and uh, football and baseball and, you know, any of the things you have in your house. I'm sure you have things like swing sets or you have, you know, different toys, scooters, skateboards, little bikes, um, you know, some sort of weight equipment. And you can make games out of it. It doesn't have to be a formal workout like the one at the top. It can definitely be something that's more of a game or you know something the kids will fill in the blanks for you one of the final ideas here so we have this walking walking is something that i think when in doubt just go for a walk hopefully we still have that ability but that could be walking around the house using the stairs you know touring around the basement going laps around the house right now all the ultra trail runners are doing you know big hundred mile uh runs around their house so they're doing it in like 100 meter 200 meter uh laps uh, we don't have to be quite that crazy, but you might just do a lap around the house, right? It could be incorporated. I love that the family's tied into this. Um, if you're on meetings or calls, I really don't like being on meetings or calls. Uh, so a lot of times I'll go for a walk and I, uh, it's pretty good. It's, it's a great way to sort of be attentive and not be distracted, but be moving while you're talking to people. Uh, if you can do it in person, great. We're in a time where that's not as easy. So you could definitely be looking at, you know, being on even FaceTime, I've seen people walking around like that, but you could certainly be on a, a phone call with someone, catch up and the hour goes by and you've been walking for an hour, right? Versus sitting while you're doing that. Um, on the bottom here, we have gardening and I want to tie gardening in with cooking. Again, when we're talking about little motions, obviously that we have some, you know, stooping down, squatting down, we have some uh, wheelbarrow up, lifting, that type of stuff. So those are motions that do count. This is light activity that does count towards, the, like I say, the, the bone health, uh, feeling it like you're outside and your mood. Uh, but when we're even things like chopping food and, and cooking our food at home should be counted towards our movement of the day, right? This is light activity. This is stuff that we're not just sitting passively. We are sort of standing and having to move and use our body in different ways. And all those little cells, all those little joints in our body need that movement, right? It's moving blood through our body. Um, and it's not just strictly this idea of calories or a workout. It's this idea of movement throughout the day. Um, making life harder is maybe a way you could describe that. But I think making life more active is a better way and that we're, again, doing this with people we like, hopefully, you know, talking to them virtually or in person um, and gradually building that over time. I wanted to finish with sort of a, a, a slide that ties into what Molly was talking about to start off with, where, you know, a lot of people aren't exposed to exercise and maybe don't have that exercise bug during this time, we have a lot of people in our lives that maybe don't have that access and are maybe more restricted and less motivated to get out, right? It's harder for them to get out. They've been told not to go outside. Maybe they don't have access to their usual gym or, again, commute or whatever they're doing. Um, and I think this slide, this is out of uh, Victoria, Australia, uh, really sort of, it, it's, it's talking about young people, but I think it applies to a lot of people, right? It, they, they, they go for a walk if someone asks them, right? And, and they enjoy it more if someone asks them and they're out there and they're just talking. Again, the hour goes by quite quickly. Um, you can see the, the big number there, the bigger number there is the anxiousness, the, the, the symptoms of any sort of mental health are improved by getting outside. Uh, and 
to get out of the house, honestly, right now, as a, as a fidgeter and just someone that needs to move and be outside, it's, it's a great excuse to get outside. So if I could leave you with anything tonight, I think it's this idea of starting slowly with whatever you're doing. Again, that might be walking, if you're, even if you're a hard-charging athlete, and to try and make it more social and more holistic, for lack of a better word, where we're tying that into things that we're doing and doing it with people. Um, to try and build that into the day, right? So not just an isolated hour, but we're thinking about how that whole day can be a little bit more active. All right, so that is sort of the end of my presentation and hopefully that um, is of use to you. Um, if you do have any ideas or questions, you can certainly connect with uh, Molly or myself uh, through the consummateathlete.com uh, and then also on social media and I'll let Molly just finish things up here for you tonight. All right, as I boot him off stage. Uh, thank you again, everyone, so much for, for taking the time to, to hang out with us tonight. Um, hopefully, once we're all back outside on the playgrounds and in the parks again, uh, you'll say hello if you spot us. Uh, and of course, we're hoping to see everybody at the, the Gaiety Theater on October 9th. Thank you so much, um, and take care of each other and get outside. Have a good night, everybody.